Right, guys, welcome back. We are on episode four. Four? Four. Yeah, it is episode four. And we are joined with the wonderful Jack Cattell. How are we? I'm very good, mate. Thanks for having me. Good, man. It, mate, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. It's somewhat like when we started, it was, oh, it'd be cool to get you on. Uh, obviously, he's someone that we've known about for two, three years. Never met you, never spoke to you, really. We had a couple of Instagram chats, I think. Yeah, I think I, think I might have met you at one show where I was a little bit. Yeah, worse for wear. <laughs> don't know if I re- don't know if I remember that rightly. The beauty was we've obviously just met before we started filming. And I kind of mentioned, I was like, I think I spoke to you. I was like, oh, I was drunk, and he was like, yeah, same. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've kind of let it slide since then. So uh, basically, the idea of this is we want to kind of find out your story, early influences, your journey, your struggles, and hopefully by the end of it, after the course of maybe hour and a half, people kind of know you a bit better. We just want to kind of take the curtain back from what I suppose you post on Instagram and kind of see the person behind the songs and the lyrics and everything. Um, so probably first thing we're going to start with is, what is your earliest memory of music? Was it in the car with your mum or...? No, it was more my dad, to be honest, music-wise. Yeah. Um, I've always had guitars lying around the house. Oh. Um, he played when he was younger, tried to get me and my brother into it and, and playing. It was always, do you want to play guitar? Do you want to play guitar? And yeah. nah. <laughs> Never really took an interest in it. I used to love listening to music in the car, like the 60s stuff, really. Okay, stuff lovely. that he was into, R.E.M., Chuck Berry. Nice. Um, the old rock and rollers I, I really liked. R.E.M. took took quite a while. Yeah. I went to see them when I was six. Nice. Um, so that was one of my first gigs. First it's a good gig. initiation, though. Yeah, cool first, first, gig. first gig was Ray Davis from the Kinks. No oh, way. Symphony Hall in Birmingham, my <laughs> mate. That's pretty sick. That's probably... My, one of the best bands my dad's introduced me to is the Kinks. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely love the Kinks and... Waterloo Sunset, yeah. favourite song of all time. Like, there's a film I've back. just watched. Oh, I'm not going to tell stories. I can't remember what the fucking film. Was. <laughs> uh, but there's a film you just watched. Yeah, so like, you're a bit like the early rock and rollers. Is that like sort of like Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry? Yeah, Chuck, Chuck Berry mainly. Um, Little Richard, I love it. I love a bit of Little Richard. Mm. His voice was something else. Yeah. Um, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis, yeah. that sort of scene. Johnny Cash. Yeah. Um, so that kind of started where I was going with music um, when I was younger. Yeah. And then just to, as a bit of a fuck you to my dad, I, I started playing bass. Oh, okay. <laughs> originally. Because <laughs> he, he was so adamant that he wanted me to learn guitar. Well, he wasn't pushy, but it was, yeah. one, it was one of them where he was just like, you sure you don't want to start playing guitar? I mean, there's plenty lying around, but yeah. no. Nah. Just went against it, started playing bass. Um, Why bass then? Because <laughs> he wanted to fuck you to your dad. It was quite an easy one to start with, I think. I think it, mm. You know, you don't have to learn any chords or anything. It's just pretty much notes. So my brother, my brother had a bass lying around. Okay. Um, so I bought a bass off him, a uh, Squire P bass. It's, it's not a bad place to start. Yeah. No, I've still got it now. It's no, it's honestly such a lovely bass to play. Um, but yeah, started that and I've been in around a few bands. I think I started with someone you might know, David Young. Yeah. Started in his in the band. Of chorus, no. Yeah. <laughs> Me and Jared were the original two. Um, Mate, I record I've seen band. you play then, you know. Um, you probably have. I I went to a venue in, I think it was Briley Hill Way. I, 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 I might have played. Did you used to do a couple of Alice Cooper covers? Uh, no, I think that was beyond my time. Oh, okay. I, think, uh, I think we used to do. Um, it was drunk, a proper folk trio at the time then. Drunken Lullabies by Flogging Molly, we used to do. Oh. And what else did we used to do? very unheard of band called Jim Lockett and Solemn Son. Oh, okay. And we used to do a cover of Warriors. Nice. Um, but yeah, that, that's where it initially started then. I was in a few other bands playing bass and then... So is your brother older than you? Yeah, he's four years older. Oh, okay, so I take it he, he, he played bass, did he play a bit of guitar as well? Did he show you the ropes of... Yeah, he, he played both again. He he transitioned from bass to, to guitar as well. Oh, okay. um, so when he, he was pretty much done playing yeah, bass, yeah. I, I inherited that. Yeah, and, yeah. I think I got a little bit further and I'm sure he won't mind me saying that I am a better bass player than he is. He's probably a, he's probably a better guitar player than me, I'll give him that, but I, I think I was a better bass player. I just, I just really enjoyed it and I ended up in a, a ska reggae band as well. Oh, nice. That was brilliant, playing bass especially. Um, but then I started writing some of my own songs and it's hard to yeah, write so, a song around a bass line. Isn't it? That's a very good point, unless you feel in it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... These sort of like early gigs, in, are we talking like 12 years old, 13 years old or a bit later? I think, I think when I first played a gig, it was it was an open mic at the Springhead Tavern in Darleston. And I was 15, 16, I, I think. I think I played there. 
Yeah, so I genuinely think I've played there. You used to run an open mic there before yeah, it, yeah. before it shut. It's, it's flats now. Same is it more. really? <laughs> yeah. I genuinely think I've played there. You know. Mm. It wasn't tra- great. Like, is it on Quarter yeah. Main Road? Yeah. And it's like a little pub on the side. Like it's just. Yeah. It's like an, it looks like a house kind of. It's got. Yeah, not too far from IKEA. Yeah, yeah, mate. I've played. I've played now from all there. That's right. mad. I, I, I used to cut my teeth at the Barge and Barrel in Tipton. I don't all know right. Played, yeah. Mate, that that is where your hopes went to die. I'll put it down to the reason I'm still not successful now. <laughs> at 13, they see me roll up with like a beautiful haircut similar to Ryan's. <laughs> and Under like, the ass. I was like a child prodigy, and they told me I was a child prodigy, and then I stopped practicing for six years. <laughs> yeah, we'll blame that then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll put it down to Tipton. <laughs> so, where are you basing? Uh, Warsaw, originally. Warsaw. And now, oh, okay. well, now Wensbury. And oh, okay. I like to claim Wolverhampton just because. <laughs> It sounds, it sounds cool. cool. When you're no one knows where Warsaw is. As soon as you get out of like the Midlands, you go, oh yeah, I'm from Warsaw. Where? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Unless the follow football or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'll let you know the shopping centre. No idea. Yeah, I'll I'll let you know the shop. man, so yeah, that's where I'm from, um, Warsaw. And that's sick, great man. place to be. See, a lot of people usually go guitar and then move over to bass, don't they? That's what I've kind of gathered. Or is it the other way around? I don't... I don't. It comes and goes, I think. I, yeah. I find that a lot of people do what I've done where, where they go, they get so far with bass and then get a little bit bored. Did you find the transition easy? Yeah. Did you? I, th- I thought it was very easy. I mean, when I was probably six or seven, I was trying to learn how to play guitar and just, just yeah. couldn't be bothered. What got me trying to learn how to play guitar was the school of rock. Yeah. Nice. You know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah, where it's just like, oh, play a G. Yeah. And I was just like, Dad, how did you play a G? So it was just to play along with that. Mm. And then I, I didn't take it any further than learning a G chord. Yeah. Well, hello, you got a face. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds daft, but I think I think a lot of people our age did really see School of Rock as like one of them things. It's like, fuck me, I want to do that. Like, I was lucky that I think by the time I found School of Rock, like, I, I was already playing guitar. Like, I, I was there going, like, why didn't they ask me to play B's that movie? <laughs> like, I was like a cocky little 10 year old who too fake play solo. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, why couldn't I have been Zach Mooney? Obviously, I think he, he got arrested the, the other year for stealing the guitar. Yeah, did you? So I don't think he could have too well. <laughs> uh, that would have th- been you. Yeah, but I, th- I think that is the case. Where, like, I think a lot of people saw that. Because I, I remember being at school, like secondary school, and like they've put on School of Rock as like a Christmas film. And like all the chavvies knew it, and like all the girls you know, went, fucking hell, people actually know like these songs, are, like, again, like, they're, they're part of my, my, I suppose, musical upbringing. But not, they know it because of this film. Touch me, baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, da, da, da. <laughs> but it's doors in it, and like, and but again, like, because I, I didn't find the doors till I was later. When I when I was listening to that song, I always thought that like there would be a ba da ba da. I didn't realize there was a gap before the car you see. Like, but like, I think it was that, and obviously, Guitar Hero, I think was. Oh, one Guitar that, Hero was massive. Me and mother really, were yeah. massively into Guitar Hero. Were you oh, any good? Yeah. Pretty, really? pretty good. I mean, I could never play with the orange man. He. Yeah. yeah he, he eventually got. I think. Did he? Did he ever beat? I think he beat the devil on Guitar Hero Three on Expert, and I, I, I beat it once. On <laughs> That's Expert. evil. It's so hard though. Look, Through the Fire and Flames was the one we. I think we finished it once as a duo, but we never finished it on Expert. We mm. never finished it all the way through. Yeah, because he stopped. Oh, just getting time. all the tapping, like the tapping bits were so. Yeah, yeah. Complex that. You just didn't know. It was just mash buttons and hope yeah. for the best at that point. But yeah, we, we were both we were both pretty good at guitar. That's era. still probably the reason I can't use my pinky to play guitar. So it was probably because I was that stubborn on guitar. Here. <laughs> I mean, my three yeah, fingers. That was me. Yeah, but look just how stuck sm- on easy and medium. <laughs> look how small those hands are, man. You think that's getting to orange? You, you got no it's chance. Lose me bearings. <laughs> so, uh, so are we going into? So you you done a couple of bands. So you done like David Jung and everything. I take you playing like pubs and like little venues. Yeah, pre- pretty much. Pubs and pubs and a few clubs. Like. And, and then you found the passion to start trying to write songs. Is that kind of? I think, I think the songwriting thing came in just after that. Really, I think because David used to write the songs, yeah. so I, I never really had to look at it. And when you're 13, 14 trying to write songs, they're just oh, like, <laughs> yeah. they're just. I still play some now. <laughs> like I, I play one song that I wrote when I was fifteen called "Come Back" and it's got a nice little hook in it. Yeah. That it's got a nice little bit of a, a, a single on crowd participation bit. So I still play that one. But other than that, the early songs. One of my first songs was called "Skinny Little White Boy." <laughs> right. <laughs> and the verse was, 
you're young and pale, can't handle your ale. And then he was like, skinny little white boy. Why? <laughs> it just sounds like, like an Alice Cooper song. Like, song right? for, like, Limp Bizkit or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it's Skinny like. little white boy. <laughs> yeah, like, genuinely. And I remember, like, we sat there, like, my fake struck and like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> like, bro. And then I think, like, boy, like, 16, like, one of my other first songs was, like, I think about prostitute. At uh, 16? Yeah, but I think it kind of come from, like, Ed Sheeran's The A-Team. I was like, I'm going to write somewhere, prostitute. It's going to be a great song. Obviously, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, so you met, what, 16, 17 when you started to write? Realistically, I think when I started to write songs that I'd have been happy to go out and yeah. play, I was probably 15. I think. Okay. Um, Still quite young, though. Yeah, very young. It's one, it's one of them. I think you, you see people who've been writing songs since, like, they were 10. And yeah. I'm just like, well, how... Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you've got nothing to write about. You've had no experience of life at all. I mean, I had a few old breaks by then. To be fair, <laughs> at, the, at the time, I, I, again, when I was fifteen, it was just there weren't really anything going on. You just yeah. you go to school, you come home, you probably put Call of Duty on for two hours, <laughs> and then you go and play your guitar for another two hours, and then you're in bed. Like yeah. Yeah, nothing really happens, so you've got nothing to write about. But as soon as things start happening in your life, it, you can get better yeah. songs out of it. And now, now I'm at a point where I've studied it. Yeah. Like I watch YouTube videos on songwriting all the time. Like yeah. Brian Fallon's one of my like big songwriting oh, okay. idols. Um, and he he did a video it's somewhere on YouTube. You'd probably be able to find it if you look for it. And he was he was talking about how Bruce Springsteen used to just write songs about anything, yeah. and not stuff that happened in his life, and how he was trying to find ways to do that. And I feel like now, like six years from songwriting. Mm. I can kind of do that a little bit now, yeah. but I still need that influence from somewhere. Yeah, so like um, the initial spark of an idea then takes you down a story. To yeah, story. I think that's where I want to get to in the next sort of, in the next six years from there. I think that's where I want to get to where I can just churn out a song without even having to have something happen or okay. have a life event that to make a good song. Yeah, when so when you're writing songs, did you ever feel like you struggled with your voice? Did you think, did you start and go, geez, I'm I'm really not a singer or was it something you felt like you was, you was quite in tune with and you could kind of portray what you were Oh, no, to I, I really struggled with it to start with. I mean, I've been writing... I say I was writing songs since I was 15. The first time I ever sang on my own in public was 18, I reckon. Oh, OK. 18, 19, maybe. Um, Where was it? It was at... I'm not sure if you know Warsaw too well, but there's a, there used to be a venue there called the Map Venue. I, can't I think I've heard of the venue. It was, it was like down the side of Manhattan and down like a little side street. So you've got, is it the Victoria pub at the top? Okay. And then you go down the little side street, there's like a car park. And it was in there. And one of my best friends used to work in there as like a barmaid. Mm. And she was just like, oh yeah, we're running this open mic night. Um, there's going to be a few people playing. You should come down and play. I was just like, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Like, I'll do it. I've been saying for like two years at this point that I was going to do it. Yeah. And she was just like, yeah, come down and play. I was the only one fucking there <laughs> that, that went to play. There was just like four of my mates um, and the bar staff. Yeah. So I got up. I was absolutely shitting myself, I tell you. <laughs> I was so nervous. And thinking about it, it's harder... Ne- knowing now that it's harder to play in front of less people than yeah. it is more. Like, I can kind of see why I was so nervous. Of course. Yeah. But that's the first gig I ever played and then just went on the open mic circuit pretty much. Yeah. Um, played around Warsaw, uh, Wolverhampton, Birmingham. And then, yeah, people were starting to to say like, oh yeah, you, you're pretty good. So I suppose the difficult things was, like, I, I think back to like, my first shows, like, I can imagine the same with you with that open mic, is that, you know, the people that are there to support you, you know that they're going to be there, like obviously in hindsight, looking and going, oh, I hope he's not really shit because it could get like really awkward yeah. quickly. Like, you know, if you if you were naturally bad, they could turn and go, "Oh, you you know you were great, well done." Like, takes bravery. That was like when you were the prodigy. Yeah, and then, you know you might, you might get deluded for four bodies going on the bollocks. And then, <laughs> <laughs> Never pick up the guitar. <laughs> yeah, like so. I, I suppose, but again, I suppose you're there going, "Well, like if they tell me I'm shit, then I'm, I really am shit." So I suppose the fear comes. From oh, that they would though. Like, yeah. I've, I've got that sort of friendship circle. We're very honest and very dry sense of humour as well yeah. that's good though um, yeah. which does help I, I'd rather have that than people who are just going to lick your ass and say oh, well, that's, you the, don't best want people thing, that's the best thing that you've ever done because that's when you get, you end up on the X Factor as one of the yeah, joke yeah. acts of course you do. so what was, their, what was their response then first gig they were really impressed I think 
did I play one of my own songs that night? I don't know if I played one of my own songs. I think um, I played two covers. I can't remember what they were. I think they'd probably be able to tell you. Hmm. But I'd had a few before I went on just because nice. I was absolutely <laughs> shitting myself. Let's <laughs> try and calm the nerves. It didn't help. Um, but yeah, it just spiral from there really, and then. I think it was easier going to the open mics after that because yeah. they'd seen me and said like, yeah. oh yeah, you're pretty good. My dad had always said like, you are good enough to go out. He said, don't get me wrong, you're not like the greatest singer of all yeah, time. Yeah. Um, but again, he, he's very honest and if he doesn't like something, he will he will say just, yeah, that was, that was shit. <laughs> See, what, what I find interesting is that our stories are very quite similar in the point of it took me two years to build up to play an open mic. Like, there's a pub down the road called The Maverick Great. Yeah. Uh, say, mate, honestly, if you want to play an open mic, if you want to go back to open mics, that open mic is the yeah. bollocks. Like, rams out, to be fair. And it took me probably two years to build. Oh, I kept going to my parents, I'm going to go and play that. I'll go and play that. Go on then. <laughs> go on then. Oh, well, I've got this and blah, blah, blah. And then eventually I got kind of got dragged there. You build up this idea, though, that everyone's just going to be amazing musicians when yeah, yeah. the reality of open mics, as much as, as much as they're a great, you know place to be mm. people just do it for the fun of it yeah, and of there is there is some really really awful awful <laughs> yeah. musicians that play at open mics and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way because I know yeah, that yeah. these are the musicians that yeah they just do it for a laugh yeah. and they do it because they enjoy it or they're proud fine. of a song they've just oh yeah, on, yeah. Like, and I completely appreciate that but there is, you do see on the open mics here you do see some absolute <laughs> You're not wrong. Absolute okay. gems yeah. of dreadful, <laughs> dreadful I'll t- music. I'll tell you something. The closest I've ever got to quitting music was after playing an open mic night. I um, I'd just come back from uni, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go my own way. I'm gonna start writing my own songs and sing them. Gone to play an open mic night. It's um, it's the really small. Where John Langford? The mitre. Uh, the one in. Where we go quite often. I've literally just talk- the Maverick. Yeah, Maverick. Sorry. <laughs> literally just fucking said. <laughs> sorry. That. So, so with the Maverick, I've, I've I've turned up, and my mum and dad are there. I'm wearing a sheepskin coat, like I look like a pimp, but like <laughs> I, in my head, I'm there going, "That's a fucking image and half." That is like I'm, I'm going to be like the next like Bob Dylan or whoever I was trying to be at the time. And then started playing this song, mate. Couldn't find the key. Like, and I, uh, <laughs> you still can't, like, mate. Genuinely. <laughs> Is that you there? Bro, I'm, I'm, I'm 20, 21 at this point. I've been doing music since I was 12. I've gone to do an open mic night, start right from the bottom, like now I'm singing rather than just being a guitar player. I couldn't find the key. I'm in the car on the way home, I've got a beanie over my head, like crying. I think Oasis is playing like. And you're yeah. 21 like, at this point. Mate, I'm, yeah, like, bro, like, literally, I think we're listening to. Um, and all at the stars. <laughs> Shit, you know, we just need to stop crying your heart out. I'm there crying. I'm going like, to be fucking Noel Gallagher, am I? Like, <laughs> so I Holy appreciate the struggle of But they are, and going back to not being disrespectful about them, they are such a good place to start out because yeah. you realise that the whole thing about singing in front of people isn't that big of a thing. Even Mate, if, whether you're good, care. whether you're shit. Like, yeah there's no in between it's not that big of a deal and I think without that I'd never be at the stage where I am at now and especially in terms of stage presence I mean ever since ever since I've started people have all that's one thing people have always commented on that oh, okay. I'm quite good on stage and I'm completely different to how I am in person on stage yeah. um, in terms of confidence and I think that's just not giving me an ego but giving me that okay well I need to keep doing that. Well, it's not an ego, is it? It's it's knowing what you're good at. I think. Yeah, it's um, knowing your strengths and knowing your weaknesses. Feeling comfortable as well, isn't it? Like because obviously, like an open mic, with all due respect, no one actually gives a fuck if you're good or bad. Yeah. If you're really good, then it sticks out, doesn't it? But yeah. after time, they're there for the point. They're just fucking sat there drinking. It's like, and it's like karaoke, really. Yeah, well, yeah. literally. But what point did you think you could use? You, you were like, right. I seem to be all right at this. I'm going to start taking it seriously. I think. I recorded an EP um, and did an EP launch and I think sold out the top of the Actress and Bishop. Nice. Um, nice. So I think at the time it was, they hadn't got the new stage in there at this point. Mm. Um, so I think it was, I think it was 120 in there, I believe. That's a good way to start. Um, so how many years ago is this then, hopefully? That was 20, 2017, I think, four years that's ago. Not, that's not that Started 2017. Right? How old are you then? 
I'm 24 now. You're 24. See, oh, I thought your journey was longer than this. I thought oh, I thought you were no. like 26, 27. To be fair. No, I'm pretty. Still pretty new to it. I'm still still learning. Hmm. I, that's one thing I'll I'll never say. I'll never think. Oh well, that's that's it. Like I've got to where I can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always think you get better with age. Of course um, you do. Yeah. Like a fine wine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, not quite. Not quite a wine. No, not that classy. Um, but yeah, Rose, I think. Book I, fast. <laughs> <laughs> I think, in terms of knowing knowing your level, I think I got to playing open mics weekly, where I thought, again. I don't mean this in a big-headed way or yeah. egotistical way, or even with disrespect to people. I thought I'm probably the best one here. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to you've got to kind of take that leap to go. Maybe I've outgrown it. I get um, that. Yeah. And, and when when you get to selling tickets for gigs, you can't go to an open mic every week because people will think. Well, I can just see him for free next week. Literally, I can hear yeah, probably yeah, yeah. Five of the songs that he's going to play on that night. Uh, so why would I spend f- uh, five yeah. or two quid, three quid, or whatever it may may have been at the time, on a ticket? So we, ha- I had to really sit down with myself, and I spoke to a few people about it, and they were like, "Yeah, I think it's time to sort of cut loose." I still do the odd one here and there, a bash will ring me up or something, and or drop me a message and just be like, oh, "Do you want to do you want to come down and play this?" And yeah, if I've got nothing yeah. on the night, like it's it's good laugh, and especially now that I've got the band with me as well. It's completely different playing a show yeah. or, or an open mic on my own compared to with the band. Yeah. It, it's, it's just different gravy and I think that's what's kicked us on so much and they deserve a lot of credit for you know they, I know they don't get the, the glory with the name I, no, it's still mine but um, there's three so lot I've just had a term I've literally <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, Alex, you egotistical bastard. <laughs> I hope you're watching. <laughs> but it's, it's one of them, bro. Like you know, like I suppose we're kind of talking about like open marks here. It's like it, it's the thing you do before you get a real gig. But we, we always fall out of love with the whole selling tickets to play and making sure all your friends and family come. Whenever we fall out of love with music and the whole gigging scene and maybe the the pressures of having to do social media, the first thing we do is we go back and we play open marks two yeah, times a we week. Do, we do, yeah. Because it makes us fall back in love with our songs and. You know, sometimes you're playing and go like, obviously, because I, I, I was in a band that I suppose you had to hear the songs as a band, but I could yeah. open mics and go, look, I do have a band, but I just want to play my songs. Like, What's nice yeah. is when you if you go to an open mic and turn heads. Yeah. It's so, again, I value that over any gig, really, because, again, no one in there gives a shit. No, and if you're there, turning heads there, yeah. you can turn heads at a gig where you've sold 50 tickets to your friends and family and yeah. people who like you. That's great. You put a fucking great show on. But if you're turning your heads to people you don't know, same as with a gig, you've yeah. got support artists yeah. and they bring people and they you turn their heads, yeah. that's a fucking completely different ball game. Like, well, that's the thing. I think that's what I, str- I try and stress as much as I can to, to my bandmates is that you know every gig is an opportunity and especially the support slots. We've just supported the clubs last yeah, year yeah. When, gigs were, when gigs were a thing again. Um, I'm going to crawl, man. Don't, oh, no. don't bring that up. <laughs> Socially distanced. It, but to be fair, it was still good. All our gigs are socially distanced. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, socially it's distanced for four years. It's hard to cram four people into a Sunday. So. But yeah, we, we just supported the clause, and for me, that was, you know, a massive, massive yeah. show. Yeah. They're a band that I've loved since, like, you know, 16 came out, and even yeah. Shut Me Up came out, and, you know, Shut Me Out even, my bad. Um, and yeah, I've just loved them since that point. Yeah. And to get that show was just three years of hard work badgering Liam to just get, yeah. like oh yeah get us on support for that if you ever need a support you know yeah, yeah. you know where it we are it's being in the era people aren't it like, yeah. it is in, people people can see it as arse licking maybe on social media but I wouldn't do it to bands that I didn't like yeah. you know, of course you wouldn't yeah and, yeah, and that's the thing you know I'm, I'm not in this for clout I'm in it for the love of it yeah. um, you want to make a career out of it if you want to do oh, this yeah, for the rest of, of your life and if you've got to do that I mean like a fucking Name drop. It's you Tom know he's fucking coming. Yeah. yeah. I supported Tom Walker. I supported Tom Walker at the Sunflower Lounge when. Fuck you, you're is trying. This the, is this the third time? It's the third time, to be fair. No, no, but it's relevant. It is relevant. Like, it's it's going to be a cutaway of every podcast, isn't it? <laughs> Tom Walker. <laughs> no, but I supported him at the Sunflower Lounge and. Again, 
Does he watch the podcast? Does he fucking <laughs> give a shit? They watch Royal this, Diamonds. Well, well <laughs> this is what I'm getting on to. Fucking... Don't like, leave a light and he turned the light up and fucked up. <laughs> I fucking... I, like, I worshipped him before that gig. Like, mm. I fucking loved... Like, he had Fly Away and which was a great track. Like, fucking absolute banger. Supported him. He went for food during my set. And then I said to him, did you enjoy the songs? And he was like, yeah, man, they were class. I knew he weren't fucking in there. <laughs> like, and then after that... I, I fucking hate him. <laughs> <laughs> and then he got successful. Yeah, yeah, literally. But like, again, same with like, it can seem like arse licking if you're like going after a band that you like, but if you fucking genuinely like them and you want yeah. to work with them, it does, it's not arse licking. Like, it's, you're, you're trying to move ahead. Like, I don't fucking call out Tom Walker because I think yeah. he's a twat. But like, again, I, would, I wouldn't go after him if I didn't like him. It's Tom, so- if you are watching and you need a support... <laughs> You Fuck you, you ginger twat. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same way with you though, Jack, because like, I saw that you, you managed to get on the live stream with Tom Grennan where he's like getting like, fucked oh, up yeah. to talk and like, I saw I saw you like show a track and everything and then, obviously you've just posted a cover, of, you're covering a song. Now, from the outside looking in who didn't know your music, you'd look at that and go, oh, he's trying to get on a bandwagon, he's trying to do this, trying to do that, but I can hear Tom Grennan in your songs, yeah. so I can tell you listen to him, I can tell Definitely. you're a fan. The same way that I comment on everything Ryan Adams ever does, not because that I want him to like recognise, but because like no, I, I love. But you take stuff. that opportunity like, if he was given to you. Same oh, as yeah, you took the opportunity. Like, to be How did that come about? Because it, it was, was out of the fucking that blue when I was. I'd just come off a live stream, funnily enough, on Instagram. Was it Instagram? Or, Always. I'd, or I'd filmed I'd filmed something. So I was wearing wearing my suit. I think I'd just filmed a video actually um, for for YouTube, and I was wearing a, my nice suit, and I was just like. Oh, he's gone live. So I just joined and didn't think anything of it. Just wondered what he was chatting about. Thought he was going to be talking about his like new album. So I just joined. I had, I had nothing to do. I was just sat in bed, like, and uh, he was getting people on. And then I saw a few few people in the comments. Snape or Music were one of them. Mm. Um, and they were just like, "Oh, get Jack on, get Jack on." And then it was just like three or four of us were just commenting, commenting, commenting. And I think the comment that caught his eye, because he, he commented on it before he got me on, was I put, Tom, I've got a better suit than you. Let me show you. <laughs> and he, he, he was like, he was That's reading it. through the comments, like seeing who to pick to go on live with next. And he got someone else on before that. And he was just like, and then before putting me on, he just went, who was that guy that commented on, commented <laughs> on his suit? And Snake Oil had commented saying it was me. So he got me on. Yeah, it was, I was buzzing, man. How was your feeling? Nervous? Shit. A little bit, yeah. Like, I don't know why. Like, I suppose you you build up this whole ideology of people. It's fucking Tom Grennan. I, um, I kind of met him. He, you know when he did his world record attempt? Yeah. And I, I think it was around the same time as lighting matches. He was doing a thing where he was trying to do more as many gigs in like the day as like, set the record. He was doing a uh, Bridge North at half ten in the morning in a pub that wasn't open. <laughs> Me and my brother have turned up. It's middle of summer. We've got our wolf shirts on. Got a fucking pint of ale there. He's set. We're like, this is gonna be great, man. He's rocked up. To be fair, he's looked out. Says, "God, I think he said something like my granddad was a Wolves fan or something." And then like played like this four song set and like gone off on his way. That's not meeting him. Don't you? Yeah, 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 <laughs> don't start name dropping. Yeah, no, no, Are you not, name dropping no. against someone you can't name drop against? <laughs> I'll no. support his home walker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but he, his granddad's a Wolves fan, and I played for Wolves for him, we know that. That's true, <laughs> actually, that is true. Um, so, yeah, so, like, but I remember seeing him going... Under nines. What? Under nines. Two under elevens, mate, I'll represent Wolves. You did, Wolves. did you? Two years, I had the contract <laughs> at Wolves, bro. Well, you started under nines. Yeah, I think that's what I signed. Got tell, me under tell, the people, yeah. tell the people why you got... No, it was it. Was, was, it, was, it, a was it a knee injury? No, he has got a knee injury. I've got ligament damage in the prime and centre there, bro. No, I was too small. Too small for, for two and three inches. Too small for a keeper. <laughs> but yeah, Tell exactly, that bro. Like, <laughs> but um, I, I, remember, I remember quite a lot of that very fleet moment. Yes, I did a meeting, Ryan. Thanks for making me look like a twat. Um, <laughs> but I, you I, spent the last four episodes <laughs> making me look like a twat. <laughs> Don't stop. I, I remember like, the, the, obviously the, like, how he was on stage. I remember like, he's actually just a bloke. Like He's a genuine... He seems like a really sane he guy. Is, and, uh, talking about meeting you, I've actually met him. Yeah, like, that's uh, sick. He went to. Um, did you find what you've been looking for? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> um, he did. He did a gig in Coventry, outside um, the botanist, in front of the. Oh, I don't even know what the statue is called. Someone, someone will comment on it. If the candid lads are watching, is it, it Lady Godiva? Lady Godiva. Yeah, he did it outside that statue, and I play a lot of gigs at the botanist in Coventry. 
So I was just like, I saw it in the morning that he was going to be playing there. I was just like, oh, I've got to go. I've mm-hmm. got to go. Um, so I drove there and he finished by the time I got there. And I was just like, oh. <sighs> as if, like as yeah. if I've missed it because I could have probably spoke to him, give him like a CD or something. Yeah. And then oh, I was bursting for the toilet. So I went in the botanist. <laughs> Funnily enough, for a piss, I was playing there again that night. So when I went back, they were just like, "Weren't you here earlier?" I was just like, "Yeah." So I went in for a piss, and he was sat there, like with yeah. John Dawkins and like a few of the people that he was doing the whole gig for. So I just waited, just stood and waited, got chatting to a few people that were obviously doing the same as me. Mm. And then as he was leaving, he was just getting like ushered out pretty much. Um, and I just shouted him. I just like called him over. And I think he thought, who fucking hell are you? Yeah. Um, but I gave him a CD. I got a picture of it, like, with him holding my CD. That's so and I, sick. I was just chatting to him. He was clearly in a rush to get off. Yeah. But he stood there for, like, ten minutes just chatting to me about my music, like, how I'd recorded it. And there's a song on there called Your Royal Highness. And he was just like, ah, oh, it's close to mine. I was mine. listening yeah. to that earlier. Um, he messaged me and went, oh, it's got a song called Royal, Royal Highness. Check it out. I've gone, is Tom Grennan something? Like, yeah, you literally yeah. said, "Is it the Tom? Is it a cover of the Tom Grennan song?" I was yeah. like, "No, no, it's his own." No, he, he commented on it, and that's that's why we've called it "Your Royal Highness" instead of "Royal Highness" because <laughs> we didn't it. want that clash. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, he commented on it, and he was just like, "Oh, you know, like fair play." So I don't usually get given like CDs off people. Yeah. So I usually get people like yeah coming up for pictures or like just yeah. saying, "Oh, check out my music." But he said, "I've never been given a CD." He listened to it on the way home. He said, "Whether he did or not, Tom, did you? <laughs> did you really?" Well, yeah, yeah like I messaged him that night. He said, um, "Hang on, if he does what sees, please." What you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like as I said to him, I, he said, "Oh, I'll listen to it and I'll let you know what I think." So I messaged him on Instagram that night, and he was just like, "Oh yeah, it's sick." He said, "Like you're he doing really you well." He messaged you back. Yeah, he messaged me back. That's yeah. class. And he was just like, "Oh, you're doing really well." He said, "Just keep going." He said, "It's going to be hard, but we'll just keep going and don't let anyone tell you." That's any so different. sick because that he's took the time yeah. to message but, you but back. But that whether it's two minutes it's took him or whether it's ten minutes, like. That gives you enough to keep going for ten years. Like where if you oh, yeah, get 100%. shit, or if, if everything goes wrong around you, like it's messages like that from people that you obviously respect and put on a pedestal as like creativity and songwriters. Like that is what can keep you going when you decide you don't want to do it anymore. Hundred like, percent. And like like you say, I think it's clear to, to everyone that knows me that he's a massive influence on yeah. my music and the the tune that we've got coming up for release in May is very much Tom Grennan based because my. Um, my guitar player likes Tom Grennan yeah, as well. Yeah. So me and Anton have just wrote the next single that's going to come out. Um, and I, I played it to Alex Holm at a thing we were doing the other day and he said he said it sounds a bit Tom Grennan-like. Mm, nice. So I'm really excited for people to hear that. And hopefully, Can you drop a name of the track or not? Yeah, uh, what I see. Nice. Because to be fair, I, I find Tom Grennan quite a, quite a unique songwriter, really. I'm, I, I loved his first album, I'm still yet to listen to the second one, like... I can't oh, say I've been busy, I ain't doing anything, but like, I just haven't got around to it. The, the second one is, is very, very good. I think a lot of people have been a bit torn by it because it's a bit more poppy than the first yeah. one, but it's still brilliant. The lyrics on it are just another level. This is why I think he's weird, though, because I think it's easy to kind of glance it. So if I was to glance back into lighting matches, like there's a lot of lyrics on there that are almost cliche and they're slogans and they're almost catchphrases of everyday life, aren't they? And... I think it's quite easy to kind of see from the outside looking and go, the guy's just literally like repeating catchphrases. Like that, that's like he's, where his songs are coming from. But it's actually when you get into the, the way whether it be it. the verses or the delivery of it, the meaning comes after. Like I put lighting matches on for the first time in probably about a year, a couple of weeks ago. I went, fuck me, I still love these tracks. Like, And you, you, you are singing like these cliche catchphrases and everything. Like, yeah, but, but they're done really well and the lyrics in the verse is kind of set it up and the catchphrase is always the like main line like fan yeah. what I've been looking for yeah, like yeah. It, it's just it's so down the line but it's clever as well like it, it is. is very clever like but it doesn't you hear sound... a song title and go I think I know what this is going to be about and then it gives you all that over yeah. the course it doesn't of the sound thing. cliche does it it's like no. it just he's a very good song I haven't I think I've got his record down there you have yeah you have you, but did you buy it me no I didn't buy it I never bought something like that cool. who bought me no. that but you do have it. It's been you bought me that. Now. Maybe. Yeah, but you never listened to it. Sure. I've listened to it twice. Oh, okay. But I've never actually, usually in the background, though, I've never actually sat and listened fully through. Yeah. But I feel do like I, I feel like I need to do it, man. So it's so good. I, I want to take you back briefly to around. I take it like college years and uni years. So I imagine this is around the time that you decided you, uh, not that you didn't decide you wasn't going to do music, but like you hadn't decided that this was going to be, I suppose, the path you'd chosen. So obviously, you shot me when you just said it outside. Like so, you found. 
chemistry was it was like yeah I've got, I've got a degree in well passion you I've, got, I've got a degree and yeah. a job in chemistry so uh, did you go like away for uni did you go and live somewhere else no I went to uh, ULB Oh, okay. The best of the two Birmingham universities. <laughs> um, yeah, I went to University of Birmingham, so I stayed at home. Um, and my mate was on the same course as me. But it was one of them that it was always going to happen. It was it was always just going to be a backup, I think. Mm. Um, my mum had always instilled that in me that, yeah, you might want to do music, but the money in it isn't great unless... Yeah. Unless you make it to a certain yeah, level. Yeah. Obviously, like, there's plenty of people in music who who just make a living you can't and call course, yeah. Yeah. just completely go under the radar. But I think she was just like, yeah, make sure you get a proper job um, just to fund the music. Yeah. Like she said, don't stop the music. I'm not saying like don't do it, hmm. but always have that backup in case yeah, it doesn't doesn't work. See, that's interesting because we went against the grain. Yeah, we're the opposite. So like, we went no backup. Yeah, like my mom. I remember. I was I I wanted to be an F one mechanic when I was fifteen. That's what I was. And oh, okay. I, I'd signed up to I'd signed up to Dudley College to do mechanics, and then I picked a fucking guitar up, didn't I? Ruined my life. <laughs> and then went I went to mom. I went show me how to get off that course. I want to go and do music, and she cried. Yeah. She cried. She was like, "What are you doing?" Blah blah yeah. blah. And I was like, "Just come with me to the open day, yeah. and I'll let the guy explain it." And he was my tutor, Dave. And he was like the guy from Whiplash, like he was pretty brutal. Like he explained, he explained all these jobs you can get to make money. I've never done any of them. <laughs> like, but again, he kind of gave me that kick up the arse. Go, I can't, actually, if I want to, I can make money out of it. Yeah. I haven't, but yeah. but you, but you know what I mean. Like we went against the grain. Like I fall out of my parents, yeah. fucking every couple of months over it. But I'm relentless. But you're but. The great thing about you is that you are still fucking relentless. You're more relentless than fucking yeah, us yeah. about the way that you work. Your your work ethic is ridiculous, mm. but you've still got that backup plan. Well, for, for, it's funny you say about work ethic. Is that it, when I first got with my girlfriend that I'm with now, we've been with her for what four and a half years. I, I'm not sure. I think her mum was taken on me straight away, mm. very much like, oh, he'll be the Troy Bolton and you'll be the Gabriella. I was just like. <laughs> What? Uh, <laughs> At least you're all in it together. <laughs> oh, Shut say. up with your fucking point. <laughs> right, I need I'm going to have to walk out of the Sorry. Um, right, sort of but I, don't th- I don't think a dad was necessarily too keen on me at the start okay. I, d- I don't know if that's the truth or not I'm Steve don't hurt me um, is he a big guy yeah, he's about the same height as me but he'd probably take he'd me his ass in. <laughs> <laughs> when I say he'd probably take me in a fight an awful well he'd take me in a fight um, yeah I'm not sure if he was too taken on me because obviously yeah I was at uni but it was I was a musician mm-hmm. um, but I think until they saw what I actually do in terms of yeah, I work. Yeah. Like, I, like now, I go to work. I come home. Mm-hmm. I'm either on social media. I'm creating something. Yeah. I'm writing. I'm recording or whatever. I'm always switched on to music. It's cool. like yeah. having two jobs. Yeah, of course. Um, I think that's the way you've got to treat. It. If you want to, especially off your own original material, I think that's the way you've got to treat. It. You've got yeah. to treat yeah. it as a job and it does get hard at times and you do lack motivation and social media is such a big pressure as well mm. you know we were talking earlier about if you don't post for a day you feel like oh well yeah, that, mate, yeah like- the interest has gone but then when you when you take a step back and you really go into the analytics of it you know you look at bands are big on the local scene candid the claws they yeah. don't they don't post for the sake of it and I think that's the big thing that people get wrong and the big yeah. misconception about it's quality music, not that, quantity isn't it yeah exactly and I think that's what I got wrapped up in to start with while I was at uni it was oh, well, I haven't posted anything today let's just quickly whack a whack a cover together yeah of course and it would just be me and an acoustic guitar it wouldn't be recorded properly yeah, or anything yeah. and it, listening back they sounded okay but compared to what I'm yeah, yeah. putting out now yeah. it sounded like shit because yeah. your lockdown mm. covers work quite well, mate. Like, I think you've got like, maybe multiple cameras, and obviously you do it. So you're playing the parts, and then you kind of cut between what part you was playing as you was doing it, wasn't it? Yeah, and it, funnily enough, it's lockdown that started that. I've I've always had Garage Band on my laptop, and I've always had an interface, mm. but just never used it. No. My, my girlfriend had bought me a, a microphone and like some decent enough headphones yeah. um, for Christmas the one year, and I just never got round to using it because I didn't really know how. Yeah, and then. The first cover that I put out like that was, no, the way I, the way I got into it actually was I wanted to do a cover of Same Jeans by The View because mm, okay. he was um, Carl Parsons was like 
He's not Carl Parsons. Whatever his name is. Carl Francis, I think. Um, is it the song for four days now? Blended? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> he was like, oh, yeah, I'll share the best ones on social media. I was just like, oh, sick, okay. But I wanted to play the harmonica part as yeah. well. And I wanted it to sound fucking good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously I couldn't sing, do the harmonic part and then sing again. So I had to like cut it. I did it on iMovie and I just did two separate videos. I didn't record it in GarageBand. And it sounded okay. I was just like, oh, I could have done that. Yeah, yeah. I could have done that a bit better. So the first one I did was Where Are You Now by The Claws and that that blew up as well. I did like um, that track to be fair. So that's how I got into recording on GarageBand. It's, it's changed the path that me and the band have gone on we've gone from sort of this level to this level now yeah yeah because the studio time compa- for Love Me and London Town the studio time it was just oh, well shall we try this shall we try this mm. now it's here's the demo yeah go go and like learn a part to it play it nice because I saw oh, you did the cover of All I Need didn't you by Jake Book when he was doing the campaign no I Ryan Evans did oh shit my bad You've got the wrong Wolves musician there. Yeah, no, I've, I've done I've done a cover it on live streams. That's my maybe where you've yeah. Where I do watch it, so I was probably from that. I saw it. You did cover Tom Grennan though, didn't you? Yeah, I've yeah. done a f- I've done a few Tom Grennan ones. I did early on. I did found what I've been looking for, which you know, it wasn't one of my best. I think that's honest. the one I've seen. Um, just because I couldn't play the dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so I just had to I just had to splice it and just keep like repeating yeah. it. But then I did a cover of Amen off his new album, nice. and that was probably one where I really experimented with backing vocals. Nice. So now, as a vocalist, like over lockdown, I think again I've gone from here to yeah. sort of there. But it's adding tall to your locker as well, isn't it? Like it is, and being a lead vocalist, you sometimes forget about how to do harmonies of course, um, yeah. so so figuring that out has been a massive help especially like going into the studio yeah. adding so many layers now well I think as Ridiculous. musicians though you, I think especially <clears> as <throat> people that write the songs as all three of us do you get into the you get into the mindset you know what you're good at so yeah. I'm, very, I'm very much a purist so I wouldn't like I don't spend time doing social media because I'm like if you build it that will come <laughs> they don't by the way <laughs> spoiler alert <laughs> they don't um, but I was like because I, I kind of know what I can do, I'm, I'm reluctant to then be shit at something else. So, yeah. like I won't do BV. So even when like we did the like the, we've just done a new record for me at Ryan's like here, and I was like Ryan, you're doing the BVs. I was like, Cause I can't harmonise. And like, I would force you to do the BVs. Yeah, you can though. Yeah, well that's the thing that, that like one of the tracks I've just sent Ryan back to well, when we got locked down again was I was like, I sent him. He's like, oh, you done the BVs on that. I was like, yeah, I had no choice because Ryan wasn't there. Yeah. And then, like, obviously, my brother's sitting in his car. Oh, I'll take it, Ryan did the BVs. So like, well, that's what I always said. You always like, they're my BVs. Yeah. But you done them. Like, it, it was yeah. the same sort of BVs that I would write. Yeah. But you did. But I suppose by like, being them. in a room with you, I'd subconsciously kind of picked it up. And, like, I suppose I didn't have the issue of being bad. I mean, he's seen me trying to do somewhere. Like, I can't get it. Like, and they were all. But you are them. ambitious, though. You, your harmonies are ambitious. As in, you will try and sing an octave on a fucking track where you can't breathe yeah like, literally <laughs> but to be fair, like, like he, he, he probably hates you because whenever like we got to, like a band gig like I'm like I, I want like the Black Keys-esque backing vocals yeah all falsetto yeah so so I'm there going Ryan I just need you to sound like the Black Keys so he's there mate he has to basically remove his testicles to even get anywhere near him Shock Fantasy is the one mate yeah fucking when I have to do the backing vocals on Shock Fantasy <laughs> it's ridiculous like it's an octave on a track that he can't sing if he's drunk <laughs> like do you know what I mean like it, but it, it like it fucking frustrated me when you wouldn't do them mm. like because I thought you were being lazy is it a like, confidence thing though because I, I, I find that in the studio especially when you're doing harmonies like my on their own when you've just got your harmonies in yeah. your ears it sounds awful but as soon as you put your lead vocal over it then they sound really good I suppose there's elements of that I, I, again I'm, I'm the sort of songwriter that if someone asks me what I did like right now on the spot I'll go I'll write songs and I can play guitar. Like I'll yeah. never call myself a singer because I think that's setting me up for scrutiny. Because yeah. again, if someone actually picked apart my vocal technique, they'll go, "Well, he can't sing." So oh, same. I, I never want to put that out to people. Like I'll go, "Like no, I'm a songwriter. Like I'm only trying to serve the songs as best as I can." Yeah. Like you know, you ain't gonna hear me saying like Axl Rose, nor you're gonna hear me saying like Pound Nineteen. But I might mumble into a mic with a black country accent, and hopefully, you might still like the song. Like. <clears throat> I suppose I suppose it comes from that really, like. But the interesting thing is that you two have just said you've got bad technique, or you'd be deemed to have bad technique. You two have got dirty voices. 
Yeah, yeah. having your like because I'm yeah, yeah. clean cutting, or yeah. my voice won't break up even if I'm like your voice on the go. When you go for a note, like, yeah, like, like we all know, yeah. my voice cracks. My voice will go yeah. ah, like this, and it'll just die. <laughs> Where ours grit up. Whereas well. yours grit up. Yeah. Whereas mine cracks, but I'm yeah. clean. Like, yeah. but again, I want what you two have got, and it really frustrates me that I can't. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's always the way though. I think. If I could sing like you, I'd be exactly the same. I'd want to be able to sing like me. Yeah, you need Whereas grit. I'll move away around at the moment. Like yeah. Some of the songs that I'm writing, I listen to people like Alex Arm and, and Rob from Candid and yeah. they've just got that voice where they can kind of do both, but they yeah. can just hit them highs like perfectly yeah. in falsetto. And that's what I struggle with. Like I have to shout the highs. Yeah. Like, I get louder to get higher yeah. instead of getting quieter to get higher like yeah. they do. That's why I almost don't sing when I write, really. Because if I'm in my bedroom, like, I get self-conscious about how I'm writing and when I'm writing. So, like, if, my pa- if I know my parents are downstairs, like, I won't really want to s- scream my lyrical content because my lyrical content is normally quite... It's probably it's, about my home life. It's, or it's dark, about, like, it? And it's quite dark. Yeah, like, my, my lyrics are quite, I suppose, self-reflective and, like, they normally come from the darkest part of me at two in the morning. Um, so, like, I don't really actually ever sing my songs so I don't even know if I can sing them until I come here to record them like yeah. and then I we find that. out it's too high yeah. like, or too low the problem I've got is when, I'm, when I'm, I do sing while I write but I sing in full set so I don't show, yeah. I don't just belt out the tunes that I'm writing yeah. them there's a few that we've got through lockdown where I'm just like I'll write it in one key and then I've got all the music down for it I'm just like yep yeah, drop the key for that <laughs> let's try again yeah. I'm like so strained yeah like I'm just like no, let's drop it again. So I drop it like three keys by the time. Wow. Yeah. See, that's interesting because the way I write is I always put the track together first. So I'll always have a completely polished track with drums, bass, mm. everything. Don't I think that's how I wrote Breathe, to be fair. I did the intro for Breathe, which is like all reversed vocal and stuff like that. I did that before I even knew what song I wanted to do. Then I played the chords, then I put the drums on it, then I put it on. I don't wrote a top line. This is what I love about songwriting, though. Yeah, because everyone, everyone does everything so different. different. Do you always attack it with a guitar and a vocal? Not always, no. no. I think sometimes, a lot of the time, like weirdly enough, it goes back to my roots as a bass player. Mm. Like really? a lot of the songs that I've been writing through, like Love Me, I take it that come from bass. Love Me come from chords. Really? But again, it was one of them that I wrote. It was like stabby chords, so the yeah. chords were the same as the bass line is now. Because I heard it, and first thing I heard when I heard that song, I've gone. It, it put me into. Do you know the band The Stripes? Yeah. I take it you're a fan. I haven't listened to them enough to call myself a really? fan. Really? You probably should no, because they like, say like you. you're, you're very, very similar to The Stripes. It's, it's, it's one of, the, it's one of them where I feel, I feel like if I call myself a fan, it'd be an injustice. I've listened to them yeah. enough to, I get to like them, but I wouldn't I wouldn't class myself I, as I a fan. I imagine you really fan. would because the singer, his delivery, the way he sings, is, there's definitely similarities between And the way you two. dress. <laughs> and even the second album, really, like... They've got a song called A Good Night's Sleep in the Cab Fair Home. And it was them kind of sitting in that Arctic Monkeys AM pocket, which was yeah. like bass, kind of, I suppose, like floor toms. And obviously when I heard Love Me, I was like, like it put me in that sort of bracket and that sort yeah. of pocket. So I just imagine that come from a bass line, really. But. It's one of them. Like, that is one of the weird ones, really, because listening to how it is now, I feel like it should have come from a bass line. Yeah. Because... I'd always got that image for it that this is going to be a band song and I wrote it when I was a acoustic. Okay, yeah. So it was it was one of them where I got a, I got the love me, you make me feel alive. I got that yeah. in my head. I'd just come up with that and I was like, okay, right, let's get some chords down to this and let's just build around that. So that come from the chords but a lot of the stuff I wrote in, in lockdown has just come from bass lines. Yeah. There's one song that I wrote <laughs> while I was at Tesco I'm going to keep telling this story just to build it up because this song isn't going to get released for like another year and a half oh, but it's okay. the one I played Tom Grennan on that yeah, live yeah. stream called Dance Floor Diva and I've just got a title for it mm. like I hadn't got any music any, nothing I've just got a title and that was it like no idea of where Sounds I wanted like to go pot. well that does <laughs> <laughs> trust me <laughs> like I just had no idea where I wanted to go with it just I just thought, oh yeah, that's a really sick title. That is Dance Floor Diva. What what a tune that could yeah. be. And I was just singing it while I was going around at work, picking people, shopping at, at the time I was at Tesco. And uh, I, I just come up with the first line. It was just, 
dance floor divas looking for a reason to go out and paint the town again and then Lots. from there I come up with like a verse and a chorus for it straight away but I couldn't have my phone out on the shop floor because yeah. my manager was like always walking around <laughs> so I was just like yeah right I'm going to have to just remember this I did speak to anyone for about three hours <laughs> until the end of my shift that's a great movie, yeah, I got, I got up movie. and like typed it all out on my phone thankfully my phone wasn't dead and I, I had yeah. it because otherwise I'd, I'd have probably forgot it all yeah yeah See, I've always been the case. Like, I remember working at home base when I was about 17. Whenever I had any lyric idea, or if I was at the Black Country Museum, like, I would disappear. Like, I was, I, I'm always so certain on the fact that like, I know I'll forget it. Like, I have to just go and record it. Like, I don't care if I get told off at work yeah. or whatever it is. There has been so, so many songs that I've just literally must have forgot because the, pr- the problem is, and I'm sure you, you're probably exactly the same in this, is that you'll get one idea in your head, and then as soon as one comes, three other different completely yeah, different song yeah. ideas will come and you'll only remember the last one yeah so I'm hoping that the last one's a fucking good one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you're kicking yourself well yeah. I think that's a good place to go to a break and then we'll start hitting like London Town and stuff I really yeah. want to talk about London Town definitely yeah we'll go for a break we'll see you in two right we're back with part two uh, I think we'll do what Harry what Harry did to be honest oh okay with the lyric yeah yeah is there a lyric that stands out to you in any of your songs that you can explain to us that you you really like a, love and stuff. Yeah, it's like a key lyric. God, I really wish I'd have said to you, can I have the questions beforehand? <laughs> um, I'd literally have just thought just about that on the spot. <laughs> 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 um, come back to me on it. I'll, I'll have a okay. think and, okay. and see, see what I can Yeah, think. we'll come back to that at the end then. Okay, come back yeah. to that's that a difficult one, that. I just, just thought, no, 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 I just, I just <laughs> thought about it. I thought like, that was very good when Harry did that. <laughs> we asked Harry, and the only lyric I knew from Harry at the time was, uh, I love you, bitch. With my last breath, I said, I love you, <laughs> yeah. bitch. Yeah, was, yeah. To be fair, off the top of my head, I know we're going to come on and talk about London Town in, mm. in, a, in a few minutes. Um, I'd rather be nowhere with you than anywhere with anybody else. Fucking, he called that before. Who's listening to you in the car, Jenny, as he picked me up today. And uh, we listen to him, but obviously we talk, we're talking, we're catching up anyway, because I ain't seen him for a week. So we talk about life. And I've gone, this is a lyric I wanted to ask him about, because like, he was just about to like say it. So yeah. can you say it again, please? Cause so <laughs> the lyric, it's the follow on as well. I just love the rhyme with it as yeah. well. So it's, I'd rather be nowhere with you than anywhere with anybody else. A minute spent without you is like. A minute spent without you is what? like my life being locked inside a cell. Locked inside a cell. Something yeah. like that. It's just my song, I'm a fucking writer, I should know. <laughs> Man, it's a fucking banging lyric. That, 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 that would lead us on to London Town. Can you. Yeah. Would you yeah. say it's your most successful release? To date, yeah. Yeah. I think it's not my favourite um, no. out of all the songs I've written. I think I've wrote songs better than it that haven't done as well. Yeah. But in terms of how we got it sounding, the justice we've done it in the studio, mm. um, and the personal meaning to me, I think, yeah. Because yeah, I, I tell you what I like, and I, I I don't like whether it's bands or certain artists. Like I know a couple of bands that will release a track if it doesn't do well, they take it off and they they basically rebrand themselves and start again. Yeah. Obviously, looking through your <laughs> that's me. No, but like mine's changed Yeah, but like, change yeah, but like, like my really. what I like was when I was looking through Spotify was like there was like a WCR performance on there and mm-hmm. like. Some of them felt more like demos, but but it was still you showcasing a song. And what I liked really was, I suppose, maybe the ability to go, well, if you hear something from, say, three years ago, obviously it's not as complete as, say, the stuff you're currently doing, but yeah. the fact that you're able to still leave it there and be comfortable enough to go, well, it's still a song, it's still served me this to this point, like, it's all part of the journey. Yeah. Like I quite like that you're not maybe overly precious about taking stuff off and... No, I, I think... <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to keep talking about it because they'll do right brilliant music but Candy wrote a tune called Numbers Game but yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't think did quite as well as some of the others which is strange to me yeah. because that's about yeah not focusing on how many streams the song's yeah. getting and course, yeah. how success is like dictated by numbers but well, I forgot the track that I really loved in like it was the one time that like the, the can- Candid were like properly in my circulation of tracks I was listening to it was the um it starts with a bit of an odd time, things like doom, 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 I've been stumbling, falling. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. That's okay. one of their biggest tracks, isn't it? Um, um, I was stunning, stumbling on my nose. I mean, if you'd like to come on and talk about it, Rob, then that would be a. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't think off the top of me. Oh, 
calling myself a candy fan. Rob, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I am really. I know. I've just reeled off fucking lyrics and everything, man. But I can't. I can't think what it's called. But I remember hearing that song. Oh, that's that's brilliant. Uh, I've been stumbling, falling, I've been starting, stalling, oh my It's not a track called Different Things, is it? Can't seem to find the right path. <laughs> it leads me to the open road I only want in the Bishop of Durban all top. Um, it's not breathless, is it? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> all that work. Oh, all that work. Oh, You've just seen me work. slave away for about five minutes there, <laughs> trying to figure that out in I've my head. I've just done the worst rendition <laughs> of a condenser microphone. Where I've not been able to cut that out, any please? Please? No, <laughs> <it's good. laughs> We'll have to end that out. Oh my, mate, these podcast blows. I've got all read on here on what Mark and Ryan do music wise, and they're going to hear me do that and go, I'm never listening to a thing he ever released. <laughs> Cancel course just coming for you, <laughs> Just because you shit. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't, I don't focus on numbers, going back to what we were talking about. I don't mm. focus on numbers. And I think the, there's, there is stuff that we've took down off Spotify, but I think that's more because the song quality is brilliant, mm. um, in, my, in my opinion, my humble opinion. <laughs> um, the songs are brilliant, but the recording quality or the way that we've done it in the studio wasn't quite right. Yeah, um, that's and there's, fair. There's three... So we, I put out an album when I was solo called Keep Trucking On that I just rushed in the oh, studio. Okay. I didn't have enough money. To, to really finish it so we rushed through like 10 songs in two days um, and there's some really good material on there like Sunshine's on there um, for those that like really really follow my music I know Lou Edgley yeah, yeah. Um, he loved that album um, and some of the songs in it but I've re-released some of them on that Locked Away EP that yeah, I've, yeah, just, nice, I've just released yeah, um, that just do it so much more justice yeah. and I think that's the only reason you should ever take something down is if you're not happy with it, not yeah. Yeah, yeah, not because of numbers or anything. If you're happy with it to go out, uh, and you're proud of it, then just leave it up there. Like to fellow, like, I mean, we talk about numbers. Like my my tracks have never done any number really. Like, but when I was kind of rebranding, going well, I don't have a band anymore. Like, the last EP was very different to the first EP, which was called Unapologetically Rock and Roll. <laughs> the second EP was apologising for not being as rock and roll as I probably thought I was <laughs> and the album coming out it's like yeah I'm not rock and roll at all anymore like putting it to bed at half ten <laughs> great titles for EPs I like. oh yeah man I love a long windy one because the issue is when people search Mark Mark Oldman comes up there's another artist called Mark and Mark Boland comes up and so I have to come up with a name that's that ridiculously stupid that <laughs> people can find yeah, it by searching it, it. Yeah. and um Unapologetically, a bit of a twat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember, like, when you come to releasing like the, the second EP, I've gone. Well, I'm not the first EP anymore, but I'm not going to take it down because it's where I was at that moment in my life. So, mm. if people do find my music in five years' time, they can hear a point in my life where you know we were selling sunflower lounges and like um, Slayer dreams in walls, and we, we did all right with the EP launch and stuff. But it's like that was another part of me but to me it's still part of my songwriting bubble like yeah. I can do that the same way in two years time I might do another album that's more similar to that than it is the stuff I'm doing at the moment yeah, for like, sure. and again I think that's why like, I think you only take down songs that you feel like you don't stand by anymore maybe yeah and for us the reason that we took those two, the two EP the EP and the album that were up there is because yeah there is some good material on there that in the future I would like to re-record yeah. and I would like to release but that was so, so different and I didn't sound as good as I do now. And yeah, I didn't do it justice and I yeah. still feel that... Did you feel like the tracks got lost along the way as well, maybe in production? A, li a little bit. I think the first the first one was just, we overdid it. It was one of them where I was like a kid in a sweet shop and I was just like, yeah, yeah. we'll have a bit of that and that and that. And it, it just sounded a bit like a car crash, to be honest. I think... Yeah. And that's not saying that the producer, but it was the yeah, producer, yeah. but it was just that... First time in a studio, you're just like, yeah, yeah. Ooh, let's, let's, let's do what do yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah let, let's just try. Chuck that didgeridoo. <laughs> and you think it sounds great when you first hear it, and then it doesn't age. Get, yeah, getting older, you just you, you know what works, and and especially for us, simple is is the way forward. Yeah. So can can we talk about your Spotify? Because mm -hmm. to be fair, like obviously we've just had Alex on, we've had the Dharma on, like they're two people that numbers wise they do do very well on Spotify yeah. like I think some of their tracks have got like 30,000 streams but having said that yourself like you're also quite you're doing very well on Spotify like a couple yeah, of okay. tracks have got over 10,000 and stuff haven't you and um, obviously we, we're the opposite where he rang me 
over the moon because he just got over a thousand on Grow Together. Yeah. I got a thousand on the second track we ever released and I took it down and I haven't got past seven hundred since. So like how how was that? Did it come out the blue or did he get on playlists or was it PR or what was the almost it's, it's method? Pers- it's personal milestones, I think though. It's going going back to you hitting a thousand mm. streams, like you know, if you if you if you set out for a release thinking, oh yeah, this is only going to get yeah. two hundred, mm-hmm. then you're going to be pushing with a thousand. If you of set course. out for a release, if you'd have thought your song was going to get like six thousand streams yeah. in the first week, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you've and then you've just hit a thousand streams, you're going to be devastated. It, it, it went from seven monthly listeners to about two hundred eighty, was it? Two hundred eighty. So that's that's the thing for me that yeah. I like to focus on. I don't like to focus on the streams because yeah, you, yeah, you can get on playlists that that people are just put on in the background or mute, mute Spotify and just yeah. play it in the background and yeah. then you get in the streams great and it looks good on numbers like yeah we've got 10,000 on streams we've not changed anyone's life but on what, realistically within those 10,000 streams it looks great on social media yeah. I always put a post out about it oh yeah we've just hit 10,000 streams yeah. on this but realistically I don't know how many people have listened to that yeah, yeah. Yeah. which is why I focus on monthly listeners and that, I get that. It's how many monthly listeners are willing to stay when you have a quiet period. Yeah. And that's what I've found difficult not releasing for a while is the monthly listeners have gone from like peaking at like 1,500 to 2,000 yeah. monthly listeners. And now we've, I think we're lately we're back down at about 100, 150 or so. Yeah. Because we haven't released for six months. I, I found solace in that. So when I did the last EP, it got up to 150 monthly listeners, which again, I suppose that, like again, that's your stagnant sort yeah. of thing. But that was me, at, like full promotion, full push. But I'd come from about fifteen at the time, and I'm now back down to like twenty three. And it's really easy to get demoralised by that, and almost how dwindling, not success because it's not success, but I suppose the gratification for the work you've put in, like it yeah. goes to shit really quickly. And but I, for the last three or four months, I keep seeing one monthly listener from LA. Now, I've never met anyone that's ever lived in LA or spent time in LA. Like, But the fact that it's a reoccurring thing, that it's one person from LA, I'm like, they might genuinely love one song off that EP that has commemorated a breakup for them, or has got them through like, the loss of a loved one or something. Mm. So instead of looking at the numbers and go, oh, they've gone down, I'm there going, well, someone there has found my track through something that probably I haven't done, but it's become part, hopefully part of their playlist or soundtrack their yeah. life. I'd rather, I'd rather make an impact and impact someone's life by one person than have 150,000 people listen to one track for three minutes and then move on to the next yeah, thing. Yeah, of course. After, well, that's, like, uh, that's why I try not to get wrapped up with numbers because, yeah, you don't know where... In terms of a number, it is just... That, that's all it is. Yeah. You don't know whether it's a person, whether it's a bot. Yeah, yeah. Or, and, and that's what I hate about Spotify is that, yeah, when it was CDs, you knew you knew a person had gone out and yeah. bought it like and they'd got it they were listening to yeah. it whereas now it's oh well yeah PR companies come to you all the time don't they? all all you get is DMs or comments yeah, yeah. oh yeah we could promote this for you <laughs> and then you message it they're like oh yeah drop us a DM not that I even bother messaging them anymore yeah. when you mm-hmm. first start and you first get you're like, oh. oh my god someone cares yeah, yeah, yeah. someone <laughs> cares and then just like yeah we could promote this for you and get you so many streams on Spotify but it would cost you $500 a month or whatever and that, that's what frustrates me about Spotify is that the numbers aren't necessarily a reflection of a reflection yeah. on who's li- who's listening. Of course. It's it could be bots. You you never know. If you land on a playlist that's just botted, you might be getting fifty thousand, sixty thousand streams. Yeah. But who the fuck cares? I, like I've got two counterpoints this really because when we think about like, obviously you said that you still listen to lyrics and everything. I, I think back to sixties, seventies, eighties music when people brought the records. And the thing is, is if you've made that initial purchase and you've invested in the band, if you don't quite like the album over first listen, because you've spent the money, you're going to listen again for the next six months, you're going to keep listening. And it becomes like, again, you like the music that you become exposed to mm. over time. People used to give an album time to get into that sort of whatever sound that the band was deciding to go yeah, with. And and there is some brilliant albums that just go by the way because, yeah, it's not, it's not an indie riff that hits yeah. you in the face and it does take time and... I listen to a lot of Frank Turner and nice. uh, Tape Deck Heart. When we first listened to it, I think I think we were on the way to Cornwall. Or we were on the way somewhere on holiday, and we put it we put it in the car because he just released it. And we we're like, ah, oh, this this is this is a bit deep. Yeah. Like, mm. but then you listen to it again, and you're like, shit. Okay, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. deep. Like, I thought in you were Bowie's Backstar. 
and then he yeah. died, and that album took a whole new meaning to me. But I suppose, I suppose the other <laughs> counterpoint is because we can see monthly numbers and everything. If you if you're Mark Bowen in 1972 and you realise that you sold say a million copies of Electric Warrior in two weeks, when his fame was dwindling like 75, 76, it would because he can't because there's no way of monitoring who's still listening to the record. Mm. I suppose it's quite easy to go the other way and go no one listens to my music anymore. Yeah. Where if he was still alive now, he'd probably be surprised the fact that like I grew up with that record and I still listen to it. Probably, well, T-Rex like, has still got two million monthly listeners. Yeah, oh, yeah. Spotify. But like, Do you know what I, mean? I suppose but, the thing is like because even though they'd sell records, I suppose they saw it as like that was the only time that they could monitor like who was actually yeah, interested. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. But then there's no way of monitoring how many times you listen to a record and burn out that copy and buy another record. Of course, yeah, and literally. So I suppose there's a flip side to both. Uh, of the, the, and the, the, pro- the problem you've got now is that back then, yeah, you could release an album go on tour for what a year and then no one had no one had expect mm. whereas now it's oh so and so have released an album this year I wonder what they're going to release next year yeah. like yeah, hang on hang one? on yeah. I've just put out an album yeah. that's took me like six months or whatever to write then I've gone on tour when have I had time to go back in the yeah, studio yeah, sure. and record do you and ever, that's the pressure do you ever feel the I suppose the social media press like we, we spoke to it about like with Alex saying like you've obviously put this great EP together because I brought the record and brought the vinyl I know that's going to be in my collection here for the next 20-30 years I will still listen to this record until probably the day I die because I, yeah. I love that record it's brilliant but for the people that listen to it on Spotify and maybe give it one listen and because Spotify are constantly trying to push you other new music if you haven't listened to it in a week they will find you something else that they think oh, you yeah. like. Because they need you to stay on Spotify. It, do you ever feel the same pressure, I suppose, maybe Alex does, where it's like, even if you just release something so great, do you feel that constant need to, shit, I need another track in two, yeah. three months' time? And... 100%. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's the sorry state for music now, is that it is it is so throwaway. Like, yeah. you, Not you only can... have you got to be great, you've got to be consistent. The People sl- don't give you the time anymore. The problem is, back, back then, yeah, you, you needed a label to to get yourself some yeah. sales to get in the charts mm. no you don't no. like all you need yeah. is one one lucky break and then there's if you don't force yourself on that break yeah, so yeah. say if like an Ed Sheeran he, he got his first hit and then just got comfortable with that well his sac- second album had to be brilliant didn't oh it? yeah it, and it it so he to took be. his time yeah that's the thing it had it? to be because if not there'd be 600, 700 other bands coming yeah. to take his place. Every man and his dog now is in a band. And there might have been back then, mm. but there was there was a niche, wasn't there, of people of who, who could take your place. You had to have a label Be- to take someone's place. You don't know. Because I read a lot of autobiographies. Like The common theme was when like I read like Lemmy's and Ozzy Osbourne's and whether it be Slashes and stuff as well. But because studio time was such a commodity and it was such an expense, you had to be on the label before you got your record out. So even in the 60s and 70s, like... If you was in a fortunate enough position where someone would record you, because there might only be 100 tracks out in that week anyway, the chances are you're in the top 40. Yeah, if you're course. in the top 40, you're on top of the pops. Next thing you know, you're a number one artist, you're selling a million records, because there's only that 100 artists to choose from, and kids are spending their pocket money and buying a single or buying a record or whatnot, where we're on about every man and his dog, like someone can buy a Mac now and make well even on your iPhone there's a Gary Band on your iPhone people can make beats there's a guy called Steve Lacey I think mm. he made like hip hop beats on his phone and he like I think he, like, he either won a Grammy or he got like a nomination for like a Brit or something off it from making these lo-fi beats off his phone like anyone can make a trap now and submit it to SoundCloud and submit it to Spotify it costs you £40 a year like I think I saw a statistic like there's over like 100,000 people like a day release a track on Spotify there's that much noise at the lower level. Like the industry's not dying, but there's that many it's people splitting the carrot that is right at the bottom. It's so hard to get through the noise and get to the next level. But I suppose if you do, you're in such a great position here because the promotional tools that are available is better than anyone could have ever dreamed 40, 50 years ago. But mm. it's almost so accessible now that it's really hard to cut through the amount of people that are doing it, yeah. isn't it? Like, uh, Well, that's exactly the thing. I mean, you look back a day, Johnny Cash just... He went into a studio, sang in front of a producer who said, "Who said, well, there's pl- there's plenty of other people yeah, yeah. doing that. Like, I can I can get like 10, yeah, 20 yeah. other people doing that. Yeah. So sing me something that is from you yeah, yeah. and about you. 
like I don't care about hearing gospel anymore or whatever yeah. whatever the quote was. And obviously he sang he sang some of his tunes and then overnight it was yeah, let's get it recorded. Yeah. Because there was they didn't have like twenty, thirty people yeah, yeah. in that queue waiting. Yeah. It was he can break through now. Whereas yeah. to break through into that major you've got to have like four or five years behind you now. You can't yeah. just do it in no. in that short space of time anymore. Yeah. I don't think people realise that either. Yeah. It's because it's never publicised. No, no, that's, that's, that's we were people, talking about this earlier, weren't we? People don't talk about again, everyone thinks that any artist that they hear for the first time is a breakthrough artist. Like my biggest gripe would be that it's say in four years' time I got nominated for a Brit Award. I won't. Clarification I won't. But <laughs> if I did and I was twenty eight right and I got nominated for like breakthrough artist and I won it I'd be fuming like I'd generally there going like Literally. you only know about me now so I'm a breakthrough artist to you but you haven't seen the Sunflower Lounge gigs I've played you haven't mm. seen me having to get a lift from you so I can play in Tamworth of £40 because that £40 might get me to the next show yeah. or it gives you enough petrol money to justify you taking me to that gig like Literally. everyone wants this like X Factor overnight success story but actually the real magic is the people grinding their arse day to day not getting anything but do it for the love and I think obviously we're the first generation that's come from this X Factor culture if you get told you've got a half decent voice the first thing your nan auntie uncle ever says to you everyone at open mics yeah, <laughs> have you thought about X Factor yeah and, and <laughs> no I haven't and, and that's the thing and granted there's been some good artists that have come from X Factor like Harry Styles is an artist James Arthur is an artist like they're good at what they do but because they haven't come from the same place we have if we were to ever get the same opportunity like our albums would be so much probably better than what theirs is like yeah I maybe, do agree maybe we'd be reluctant to use co-songwriters and maybe that's probably why people don't like people independent either because we, I said it to Alex I was like if you got an opportunity I was like you know what you want to say I'm like, no, yeah. you can't get moulded like no, no. you know what you do you know what you're good at there's no way anyone's going to convince you to sell 100,000 records by changing your sound you're going to stand by what you do isn't it and but again, to me, that's where the magic is. The fact that there's probably, what, 60 artists in Birmingham at the moment that are good enough in their own right to maybe do something. I know, it's the, probably more. Level. I genuinely do. I think the soul, they're touching on it there, there is so many, yeah. so, so many that I, I just I just see and you watch them play and you go to the gigs to watch them. Candid and The Claws, obviously, the two yeah. top dogs at the moment, yeah. really, in the Midlands. I genuinely think that if they put out, if Harry Styles or one of yeah. these names in the at the very top of the charts, at the top of the top, put out put out time of our lives like mm. the clothes have just done, it'd be number one. Yeah, it, yeah. and no one can change my mind. On, I know that's still no yeah. one can change my mind on that. If a top artist like the Arctic Monkeys have put out pulling away or numbers game yeah, like yeah. Candid. It be number one of it would. because the the passion and the lyrics behind yeah, it yeah. and the story is just so relatable yeah. and the music is so good as well. It's like it sounds music. good and yeah. it's deep as well. It's not just oh here's a song. We haven't spoke about this yet on a yet on a podcast, but it's true because the thing is with Birmingham is that maybe because our own local promoters don't put enough emphasis on the talent that's here. Again, they're more likely to push a gig for a band that's come from Manchester and playing in Birmingham because it's cool and there's an image around Manchester music and Liverpool music and you know people that have come from London that play in Birmingham and whatnot like not only do like Birmingham don't appreciate how good the music scene currently is in Birmingham like people don't go and watch a Sunflower Lounge you got on a Tuesday in the hope they might find the next big act because no big act comes from Birmingham like the, the closest thing we've had recently is obviously Peace, Jaws and Swim D yeah but it never hit mainstream. But if Peace were Mancunian, I can guarantee now they'd be the same size as Blossoms. But because they're Birmingham, there's almost a stigma with our accent and maybe because that no, there's no one setting the groundwork. I almost no, do but... think that we get underlooked, get overlooked and almost no matter how good our music would be, we're never going to be the person on, say... Blue Peter talking about their new album because we don't we, fucking Blue no, but like, Peter like, we don't su- old school, then. Just yeah, but like, we, the one show then <laughs> but like, we, we don't suit the narrative because no one comes from Birmingham so it's really hard like again the closest thing we've ever had to a success story is Ozzy Osbourne Jeff Lee Robert Plant but that's 40 years ago and yeah they're huge but 
no one really wants to hear a brummy talk on mainstream radio. And... We should have the goal to break that mould. But that's the thing. Like I, I genuinely think that if if someone come on national TV and spoke like we do, it would be just as refreshing as seeing Sam Fender do it or Lewis Capaldi because no one's heard a Birmingham accent be relevant for for so long in the mainstream, and it could really help put not only Birmingham back on the map, but every every single artist like. Save the Claw's got massive right and they become the next Blossoms or... They will. Hopefully. I, I, I can say this on, on yeah. a camera right now. I think they will be the biggest band in the country. In, fi- in five years' time, maybe even sooner, I reckon the Claw's will be the biggest band in the country. The thing is, the beauty is with that is that puts Birmingham on the spotlight. So then people are then looking in Birmingham going, what else is going to come from there? The thing you'll have is that there'll be probably about 100 bands that are 18 years old try a bit too hard to sound like the Claw's. The same way when we was eighteen and we was in indie bands, everyone wanted to sound like Arctic Monkeys. Oh yeah. And if I once did a gig, it was five bands on the bill. Every single band on the bill played an Arctic Monkeys cover. Right, like that's how ridiculous it was. The thing is, is that people won't become. Say if the claws become a nationwide thing, Birmingham artists then won't be a nationwide thing by following what the claws do. But it might hopefully shine a spotlight on people like say Alex O or yeah. people like yourself or Candid and. Or even people like us by going, well, they're not the cause, but actually Birmingham has a fucking great music scene. And like the same with like when Hunger Moon were going and how brilliant they were. Like there is talent, but people almost need to realise how good Birmingham is and how consistent it is yeah. to get it the exposure it deserves to put us on the map and go, actually, this is where you go for music. And people think, start coming to uni for music in Birmingham. Like, well, people like Tim Senner have been shouting about it for a few years. I know I have as well. And yeah, bands like the Claws and. You know, Candid, even Jaws, Peace. Yeah, yeah. Like, they've all yeah. been shouting about how good Birmingham is, and it's only a matter of time. And I hope so. Again, I I will say it. I might be wrong, but I, I genuinely don't think I'm wrong. The Claws will be one of the biggest bands in this country. But if, like, that, if they no don't, doubt. if they don't, it could be the bias of territories. Again, if, say, if they get to a point where they're opening Reading and Leeds, <clears> or, like, they're on, like, mid-card... Maybe if they were Mancunian, they might have been the headline. I don't group. think you can think like. No, I don't, I don't think, think you can. You can I think because if you if you start thinking like that, then you've always you've always got an excuse if if things if yeah, things don't come about. And I issue. think you've got you've got to put that aside and think, well, what am I? Yeah. What am I doing wrong? Because that that's where the book stops at the end of the day. Yeah. Like that, there is no. If the best band in the world. Like if the, if the Beatles come from Birmingham, they'd have still be massive. Yeah. Like, yeah, the claw the claws are gonna are gonna be massive. Catfish in the bottom, and if they come from Birmingham, they'd have been massive. Like, yeah. I don't think it's anything to do with territories personally. I just think, yeah, sometimes we do get overlooked, but as soon as people come in and they they realise, yeah, it's, the, it's going to open their eyes to so much good music because yeah. look at the amount of bands we've we've chatted about yeah, outside yeah. today. Probably you can't 30, build, yeah. 30, 40 different bands yeah, yeah. that are at the level now where one song, all it takes is a label to look at it, yeah, yeah. and they're they're signed up and they're in the charts yeah, like yeah. within a year. And they're going, do you know anyone else? It sounds like. Mm. <laughs> like I think the thing is, we our movement is on its way because yeah, it I, is. Yeah, Birmingham, could be. Birmingham's got its growing movement at the minute, and it yeah. had it with people. I mean, look at fucking Lady Leisure. Yeah, yeah. she was fucking massive. Yeah, yeah. Like, Georgia Smith. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Vital. Ma- exactly. Mahalia was from fucking Birmingham as well. I'm pretty sure. I think she was from Solihull. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. people like that. Yeah, because my mate went to uni with her at Boa. Mm. Yeah, she went to Boa. Oh, nice. Um, but there's people like people like that who've had their movement but it's, yeah. n- it's just not our genre at the minute but again I, but I, I think like, if it ta- if one band does blow in Brum again if it's going to be anyone it's probably going to be the Claws or if it's come from Coventry it's obviously going to be Candid like but again I, I, I do believe in the statement going if, if it, one band does get the spotlight hopefully it, it lights up it will and start then, the and then Birmingham ev- ev- everything really goes and then it becomes a thing of that if you're a Birmingham band and you finally get a gig in Manchester there's 40 people there because they want to find the new clause and yeah. they want to get behind something like I imagine the same way with Blossoms that there's probably people in Stockport now there's bands in Stockport trying to rep the coming up the ranks the weekend trying to be Blossoms but, but, <laughs> but, 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 but you know there's probably a, 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 like a promoter in Sheffield going well we'll get that band from Stockport because they might be like Blossoms mm. like it, it does become a spoil thing but it maybe takes a band to really change the norm 
to hopefully get everyone the spotlight that they deserve because again yeah. Brummie's fucking sick like you can he go is. to a, a gig every night of the week in Birmingham over five six venues and it's fucking and if like. there's four bands on at least two of them are more than decent like yeah and then 100%. the other two are just young, and in five years' time, they're probably decent themselves. My overpass are the ones to watch as well in Birmingham. Okay. They're, they're very, very. I think. I'm they're not even sure. I think they've just turned 18. I believe. I don't, I don't quote no, me on that. They, they supported the club. The same night we did Glee Club with the Claws, they did the matinee. Yeah. Oh, mate, brilliant band. Really, really, really good indie band. Yeah. Like I say, they, I think they're younger than us. Um, I, I'm sure they're around about 18, 19. Okay. But they're. They're onto onto a winner as well. Because it's really like, good band. Obviously, you, have you heard of the Chasers? Yeah. Obviously, they've just had. Uh, ten, they've had ten thousand streams. Top ten. It was like it was top it ten was iTunes top, or something. Top ten like, the iTunes chart, wasn't it? Like they were a band. I saw them six months ago, and five of their tracks were covers. Like yeah. They're hopefully coming on the podcast because I want to talk about how it got to that mm. point where it become a, a movement. Like, but but again, that with their first release, they're able to do that, and it, it's madness because again it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So again, I want to hear the stories behind it. But again, the fact that a band from Brum that again people might not have seen live yet because they're only eighteen, nineteen, mainly playing covers. Like they were still able to do that based mm. off the support in Birmingham. Like it's absolutely mind. It's peeling that back as well. I think the what I fall victim to as my excuse is that no one will reveal anything. No one will show how they did it and blah blah blah. I'm yeah. Trying to give that, mm. but I think that that's just an excuse because. Again, grow together, open my eyes when I put that out and actually got a fucking thousand streams because I actually worked. Yeah. I was working hard. But that's the thing, like, this does frustrate me about musicians is that we don't give other artists enough credit for how hard they work. Like, no, yeah. No. I think people have come to me in the past, like, at gigs, at open mics or whatever, when, when I've had songs out and that. I'm like, yeah, but well, my track's just as good as yours, so why hasn't mine done as well? And I'm, you've done fuck all. The, the <laughs> thing is, like, I am I am a very honest person. I'm honest with my friends. I'm honest with my family as well. I'm just straight to the point. And it is it is about hard work. The harder yeah. you work, like, you, you can't tell me that Harry started... I know he got his fame through the x Factor, yeah. but you can't tell me that he's just sitting on his ass for no. 300 days that yeah, he don't... Yeah. Like, even when he was in One Direction, he... They didn't Simon, get on the for four years. Simon they, like, Cowell would have been working him yeah, yeah. to, to like, fucking long hours. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing people don't see. That and all he, they see is the good nights, yeah. them going and getting drunk, picking up awards and loads of money. And money isn't everything. And you imagine the pressure everything. of making your debut album and you've been in One Direction. Like, yeah, yeah, literally. That, that's pressure that we can't even comprehend as well. And, and for it to be as left field as it was mm, from yeah, One yeah. Direction. But that's what swung me, because it, because it was such a good rock and roll album. I was like... That was brilliant. And like obviously, when he started doing the interviews, and talk about the fact like he grew up listening to the Rolling Stones and everything. Obviously, you could hear the influences. Well, you could tell the influence. You, you just wants to be Mick Jagger, and he like. Yeah, but he looks. A bit but like he does that. it well. No, <laughs> he does do don't well. get me wrong. I lo- again, yeah. I love the album, but you can see the influence yeah. that like. But the second album's him as an actual artist, and like you can tell that he's saying for the second album, he's him as an artist. Yeah, like, 100%. maybe not trying to be the Rolling Stones so much. Sign of the Times was just David Bowie for me. Yeah, it was classic David Bowie. But you do that as your first single oh, yeah. back. He's fucking he's ballsy. Brilliant. Like yeah, really good. We talk about like people, like obviously people working hard. Like the reason we wanted to get you on was because we we can't see how hard you work behind the scene, but. Obviously, on the scenes, which is like Instagram, social media, geeks. Again, we know you're a, a, like... You don't miss a beat. Yeah, w- w- we can obviously see the stuff you do behind the scenes because your content is constant. It's it's well done. It, it's well thought out. There's campaigns behind everything. So, like, we can see how hard you work because of, I suppose, the after effects. Well, I suppose there's some artists that maybe work just as hard behind the scenes, but they don't maybe actually release the video that they've just made or maybe yeah. they don't try and make the video but they're still working on their craft and trying to improve as a songwriter before they put a video out maybe but but it is true like people probably have underestimated how hard you work but we can see how hard you do but then there is probably other people that don't get credit because they maybe don't publish how hard they work either like but you don't know until you maybe like this is why I want to sit people down because we don't know people's stories until we get them here until that curtain drops it's literally the whole reason we started this is just to the people who we always talk about, we yeah. wanted to know their story. Like you've, we've talked about you for fucking years. We'll be sat so at Northway at two in the morning, talking about bands in the local scene. And like, well, I wonder how they did this. And like, I wonder how that got to like ten thousand streams. Like, it's genuinely about 
meeting the person behind again the facade of social media yeah. and again I'd, I'd have, if someone had asked me like you win a million pounds if you tell me what Jack Cattell does 9 to 5 Monday to Friday not at any point would I have said that you're a chemist like, yeah. <laughs> you know like with, with that sort of like degree behind you because it's it's almost easy to kind of see from our perspective like I imagine most I always picture most people in the Birmingham music scene as not working because yeah. we don't musicians like, <coughs> and yeah. living for the music but I'd have seen your output and how hard you work and gone I can't imagine he does much else Monday to Friday because he's doing all this like, yeah yeah literally we thought it was a 9 to 5 mm. job for you so when, when you turn around and cover. go well I've just left work and but still put a video out yesterday and they're going the well, and, you, and, you, and you're still here yeah like, it's dedication that, that's all it is and you know if, 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 you, if you do it for the love of it which is what I stress all yeah. the time is that I'm not in it for for money obviously I want it to be a career I want this yeah, to be yeah. my source of income but I'm not in it for the money or the fame or anything. Fucking you to give up years ago, aren't you? you, you well, that's the real thing, you to give up years ago. Hopefully yeah. people can see this element of the story as well. And Again, when we talk about people giving, say, 30 seconds of a track before they decide to skip over and play the next new thing, like... That's hours of my life. Yeah. Like, it, d- hours, days, it's sometimes even weeks of but my life. hopefully by revealing this story and re- revealing how hard you actually do work, it maybe gives people the if they feel like they know you they might give you an extra like week to get to another song and oh, then yeah, they fall sure. in love with it and yeah you know. because at the end of the day image is everything now especially yeah. with social media I mean it was still it was still there back a day yeah. like image was still a massive thing but you could win people over with you now it's it's all about you it's all yeah. about your personality and whether you're a good musician or a half decent musician that doesn't matter yeah. if you're likeable and people take a, a shine to you they'll give your music a chance and that's yeah. when yeah, you can go back to that old-fashioned sort of way of the music industry where, yeah, you buy an album and then you give it a few weeks. You wouldn't just listen to it once because you'd spent that money. Yeah. It's investing in people now. 40 um, years ago, people had the music and then found out about them later yeah. on interviews when they're on BBC or something. Like, no, you really do have to get behind the campaign of whoever an artist is and then you, you, you grow to like the music as well, don't you? Um, I think that's a good place to wrap it up with a quick four questions, to be fair. I was going to quickly say, how did you find lockdown? Did you struggle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, initially, yeah. I, it was horrible. I, at the time, I was work. I was working as a musician mm. full-time, um, doing like covers work, obviously the band stuff as well. So it was devastating when it all it all came to a halt. It was hard to deal with. and I think it was just trying to keep yourself busy. Like, we've, we've spoke outside yeah. and that about it, mental health and that. Like I've always struggled with it, um, but I've always found trying to keep myself busy is the way to get out, not get yeah. over it, but to to manage it. You can eat your life without it, can't you? Yeah, and obviously lockdown when everything just stopped, like I couldn't see my missus, couldn't I couldn't like go and play gigs like I would, and mm. pretty much life just stopped for me. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, that was hard, and then I started doing the covers to try and get me through it. And now I started going into Garage Band. Then I started demoing some of my older tracks. Mm. And then I started writing new ones. And it just opened up a wave of creativity then. That's good. And especially with Garage Band, I learned how to play sort of keyboard to a yeah. relatively Passable. decent yeah. standard through just through my literal laptop keyboard. Oh, shit. Um, so synths and stuff are now on, on tracks, like mm. violins. I can test stuff out before we go into the studio. And it's just so much, so much easier in the studio, and we, we're so much more time effective. Mm. But also, you, your ideas are just another level now. Like the ambition's so, there because you can hear it. But. Yeah, because because you can try stuff, and you've got the time to really sit with these demos. You can spend more time on it because you're not paying for the time. Yeah. So you, it's your time. So it's just oh well, can I be asked today? Mm. Yeah, I can. Let's yeah, go yeah. and fucking do something. But the songs are just so much better, and we we can't wait to show people what we've got coming. Your yours is too fair. I think it's the opposite, really. Like, there was a lot of people when lockdown first come in, and I think Alex said it was that like as soon as it happened, you're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna write and record an album. I'm gonna do all this. I'm gonna do all that. By two two weeks in, you've lost all creativity, and you're watching Netflix for like the fourth hundredth time in a row. Yeah, that was me the first two weeks. I was like, just I was genuinely depressed. But it, it's been a journey, like 
I think a lot of artists, their whole lockdown has been a journey. I've had mates that don't play instruments that like I've sat in like a garden with them having a beer, like as like things are easing back up, and they've gone, like, like you're so lucky to have had your instrument. He's like, because mm. you know, he's like, I've done nothing. He's like, and I feel like I've wasted a year. Like, but at least you could be in your room writing about the current situation or whatever it is. And I suppose that's kind of been our, it's been our saviour. Like music has been yeah. every musician's saviour over lockdown because. Again, I can't watch the US Office again. Like, <laughs> I can't rewatch. Really I haven't Peter. watched the US Office. I've watched the UK one. The UK, the UK is the best, bro. Like, again, there's only so many times I can watch WrestleMania 19 as well. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm genuinely at a point where, like, if it hadn't been for music, I don't know how I would have coped. But to be fair, that that's kind of been the reflection of my whole life. Like, every bad thing that's ever happened to me, the first thing I've done is go back to music. Yeah, music. And this is going to lead into our, our quick fire questions. Now. I'm so good at transition <laughs> I'm going to kiss my ass a bit first um, what is the best moment you've had in music Wolf's promotion party. fucking yeah. hell I was going to say we completely forgot I that I say it's that get, back, get into that then yeah. get into please that. don't forget about that I did, I did warn them that they needed to mention that like I have to in every part. oh mate we'll block off an hour out for that now <laughs> boy. yeah Wolf's promotion party by an absolute mile I hey mean, did you get it uh, Jason Forrest okay. so I've been been good mates with Jason for for a year, about a year and a half prior to that. Yeah. Um, done a few things, like recorded a few sessions at the Molling in the stands, like. Um, really? In the stands? Yeah, while well, the fans weren't there, obviously. Oh, no, I know that, but I didn't know they did a lot of videos in there. Yeah, because we were going to. Well, he wanted to do it in um, the Jack Howard suite, but they were doing they were doing something in the Howard suite that day. Mm. It was just it was just by chance that we went out into. Um, to the top of the Billy Wright so I did it overlooking the pitch That's I think the video is still on um, still on the Milk Bar podcast I do I, I don't know I, I, it's somewhere on my page if you can be bothered to delve if you let us know where it is we'll link it in the description yeah it's somewhere in there but yeah, um, yeah so playing in the stand at Molyneux and then obviously we've got Nuno came in Neves. We had the dream and Neves and mate that goal against Derby I still can't get over the, the, the three, three, three year, year anniversary, anniversary that, yeah, oh no Mate, so like, don't that, you two start getting wet that, over walls on this yeah. podcast. That, that goal is like reminiscing over a girl from that. I was five, in the, five rows I fell down celebrating that goal. I was like, in the North Bank, bank row and I nearly shit myself. Mate, genuinely. So I was doing Leon Edwards' was his goal at Leeds. He was, in the, was, he was in the North Bank and for <laughs> for Wolves fans watching this podcast, he just stood up and went like that. No, That's no, all that happened in no, the North Bank because you don't sing, dear. Because I've been broke for so long. right? in North Bank. No, I'm going to give my story. So my mate, Robbie... His granddad did have a box. I I nearly got into a fight with someone when we lost 2 0 to Blues in the Championship. Oh, God, yeah. Because I'm there, I'm swearing, I'm losing Dave my voice. Is scoring that, wasn't Someone's right? turned around and go, We don't use language like that in the North Bank. I was like, Walls are fucking 2 0 down to the Blues. You're <laughs> running about my language. Like, I'll, I'll smack in the face. But I don't care if you're right. People in the old. South Bank were snapping chairs. <laughs> like, but like, right, obviously, because it was done in front of the South Bank. Like, my old site's been on the way out for the last 10 years. So, like, I couldn't really see the goal. I thought it was Matt Doherty at first. So when the balls dropped out to Ruben Nevers, he's took it on the outside of his boot. Thought it was Doherty. I believe my last words before that goal went in was, don't fucking shoot. Like, because I thought it was <laughs> Matt Doherty. I was next to that ball goes in. I nearly pooped my pants. Like, genuinely, like, greatest goal I'll ever see in person. And I imagine you're the yeah. exact same. Oh, mate. Like I say, me and my brother, it must have been about five rolls that we went down because we <laughs> sit right at the top of the South Bank. And the, I tell you, this is... Completely going off the music topic, yeah. sorry. No, <laughs> fuck music! So so there's a guy who I used to sit next to right at the top of the South Bank, uh, who used to just, before they put all the standing barriers in, he used to literally just fling himself. <laughs> like, no one would push him, he would just fling himself down, down the fucking stand. What, are you an S1? You're not S1, are you? Yeah. You're fucking S1? Yeah. Oh man, I would never delve up there. I was a sl two. Fuck that. <laughs> right, right, right up the top. So we were right up there, and he just he come flying down the side. We were fucking halfway down the stand, but I tell you that it is the greatest goal I will ever see live oh, in a football match. It was just a joke. But anyway, back back to the story that that I've got to tell on every podcast because it's the only decent thing I've done in music. Uh, yeah. So obviously we got promoted that year, and um, there was the whole talk of the party in the park. Yeah. But, I knew of that before yeah. before it was even a thing because Jason dropped me a message he was just like right Wolves want to put on this promotion party so they can come and have the trophy and have like the bus can mm. go somewhere after the whole open top bus parade 
So it's just like, yeah, we're going to do this party in West Park. Um, there's going to be 30,000 people. There are 30,000 tickets for it. Mm. Um, we don't know how well it's going to sell, but do you want to play as mm. a performer? That was just like, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, and it sold out within like an hour. I was just like, shit, I'm going to be playing in front of 30,000 yeah. people. Then Matt Murray is the one bringing me on. I'm yeah. just like, I looked up to him as a kid. I, yeah, yeah. I wish I could have been a goalkeeper, but I'm not going to stand up because you'll see how short <laughs> I actually am. But yeah, I always wanted to... You'd have made a great right winger though. Always you? wanted to be a goalkeeper as a kid. He's probably really quick. Yeah, Matt Jarvis style. But, but yeah, always wanted to Daniel be a goalkeeper. Looked up, looked up to Matt Murray, uh, especially after the penalty saving. We obviously he, looked up to him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 no, he's massive. Yeah, he's 6'4", isn't he? Is he? Yeah. Yeah, he's got to be taller than that. Genu- genuinely, he's got to be taller than that. I think, he's, six, I think he's about 6'3", like six, six, six. but like, he just feels big, man, because he's like... Like a truck, yeah, he, he's, he's built like a brick shit. He's got to be about six six. Took yeah. his knob into his sock. Man. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me the right to like walk me on and that. So that was just like, and I was. I thought to myself, yeah, there's probably going to be about a thousand people, a big park. Yeah, and, yeah. Like there was also like fairs and stuff going on. So I thought, no, nah, it'll, it'll be fine. It was like an hour before the team got there. So I was just like, yeah, it'll be fine. Walk out and there's just a sea of people. You can't see the back. And like it was just mental. Yeah, like I remember dropping, genuinely dropping. Like it's the first time yeah, in yeah. years that I've been nervous for a gig. Yeah. But I walked on. It was over within like five minutes. You played it acoustic because I didn't. There's no band. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have a band back then. Yeah. That's fucking brave. But yeah, it was just. Did just they respond well to it? Yeah, loved it. Yeah, loved it. Like I think I think everyone had had a few. Like by yeah, that yeah. time, it was. Honestly, the beautiful, beautiful summer's day. Probably about 30 yeah. degrees, 32 degrees. So it was perfect day for it. But yeah, walked on, played my songs. Like, met the team afterwards. Met Nevers, <sighs> Nuno, Cody, I've, everyone. I've got a beautiful counter story to this. And we've talked about it just on the Alex own podcast. That ain't going to be as cool, is it? Yeah, no, so it's not as cool. <laughs> but this is probably where our careers completely differ. So as a band, we had our first show. The Day of the Walls promotion party. And we were playing in Coventry on the yeah. night. So I've turned up in the pub at 10 o'clock in the morning with my mate Robbie going, can't drink too much tonight, I've got my first band show, like really excited. Two o'clock comes, we've seen the bus go fast and everything, obviously didn't get to West Park, but mate, I'm mullered. I'm in Coventry, they're trying to sober me up for the show, like voice has gone because I've been singing in another dream for three hours. <laughs> I probably had about eight beers, six Jaegers, didn't really know where I was, had no voice. Five minutes before we went on stage, pooed myself a little bit. So like I went for a safe. You need to stop telling this story. This is the man. second time, disgusting. second time today on this podcast that I've told this story. So there'll be a poo come out, did a safety wipe, went on stage, <laughs> performed the show, come off stage, threw up, and I had my wall scarf on me like mate, I was a mess. Like, but well, that, I, I where was that, that? What? Where was that? Uh, the team in Coventry. Oh yeah. Oh, the geek was in Coventry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so wh- when you was playing in front of thirty thousand people having your career highlight, he shorted himself <laughs> throwing up. Shitting I, himself. I shorted, peaked too soon. My career hasn't really recovered since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably the, he's probably the best day of my life and probably the worst day of yours. <laughs> um, so we'll go now into. Has there been a low point in your life where music, whether it be your own or whether somebody else? That you you felt has really helped kind of shape your way out of that sort of dark hole. Uh, yeah, breakups and all sorts. What was the music? Uh, at the time, like Pelle, the your last request. <laughs> no, at the time, like, so for people who have got me on Facebook, mm. I, I think I've deleted all. I hope I've deleted all the photos by now. But I had hair down to here. Just proper into like metal and yeah. and and all sorts I'm so. picturing the same fringe house so I feel like you had like a carrot no, like, you know, proper like <laughs> sweeping emo <laughs> fringe and me. everything <laughs> like Wait and Bleed was <clears throat> was the one that I used to always that was my go to break up song Wait and Bleed by Slipknot <laughs> it just sounds a bit dark doesn't it so that was that was the I suppose the song you attached to it then yeah um, but yeah I do so I suffer with depression anyway so yeah. like I go. I do go through phases and pretty much. Take medication. Me- I did. Yeah, I did for like, two years. But okay. then again, it wasn't really. You get to a point with it where. So for th- for those that don't know and ha- and haven't been on antidepressants, basically what they do is just pretty much make you numb. So you don't yeah. really just you don't really feel happy. You don't really feel sad, and I think it was having just as bad of an impact as being off them yeah so 
I, again, I didn't I didn't think they were working for me. I didn't want to go to therapy. Um, yeah. So I just decided that I was going to come off them and, and see how I was for the first few months. And then, again, fair music, come back into it. I started being a bit more creative once my feelings had, had come yeah, come yeah. back, in, in essence. Um, just started being a bit more creative, trying to keep myself a bit busier. Yeah. Running again. Um just yeah, just trying to keep myself occupied, and that's that's kept me to where I am now. I, I still struggle. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, still, I still have really rough days. Like, and I had a really rough day yesterday where I just didn't want to do anything. Got home, just lay in bed. Yeah, and that and that was it. Um, it's okay to have those days. But it is, yeah. And and sometimes you need to. People need to give themselves a break. Like you can't you can't live your life at ninety mile an hour every day. No. And you and you do need to have them days. And I think it, it's just learning learning to give yourself that bit of a break because even yesterday yeah. I was just like well I haven't done anything what what can I do mm. yeah. and at about 10 when I should have been going to bed I, I was listening to Bruce Springsteen in the shower nice. and Land of Hope and Dreams is one of my favourite songs by mm. Bruce Springsteen yeah. and it just come on on my, on my playlist like on shuffle and I just thought I've got to go and learn this song yeah. so at about half 10 at night I went and picked up my guitar after being in bed all day and, and learned how to play uh, but it's stuff like that that it's always there for you. Music's yeah. always an escape, and all it takes is one one song to come on to change your mood. See, I, I don't want to step on your story, but I think antidepressants is something that I've I've contemplated for years, really, in the sense of like I'll get to a point where I go, I maybe need to speak to someone about this, yeah. and and maybe get me out of the point I'm currently in. Um, I'm still yet to have that conversation and make that appointment and and get the tablets and try them. But when I'm, I suppose before it gets too dark, I, I really appreciate the beautiful spot of, again, maybe we feel things more than other people do. So maybe mm. a bad text or a bad conversation takes us to a point that's darker than what, say, the average person would maybe experience. Yeah. I, I suppose the reason I haven't gone down the tablet route is because as a songwriter, the last thing I want to do is feel nothing at all. Yeah. I want to write from a point of elation. I want to write from a point of complete loss and uh, desperation. Like, the last thing I ever want to do is be numb to anything yeah. I experience. So I think if I was, I suppose if I was working at a, a nine to five and maybe I was more of a functioning adult, because I'm not, maybe I'd have gone down that route and I'd have tried to numb myself from everyday life and just get through it. Just to get clock boys, in, and clock yeah. out and be more efficient than I currently am. Maybe because I take songwriting to such an extreme, like I don't see like if I'm low, I use that as then a point to write from rather than a point yeah, to dig myself too. out of. Because again, if I look back at some of the songs I wrote over the last six months, I listen to them lyrics now. Fuck me, that's come from a bad place. Like, okay. luckily I'm sat there in front of like you two now, going, I'm currently no longer in that place. If I delve back into it, I'll probably even put on my own song or I'll put on Ryan Adams, and that will get me through whatever yeah. it is that... well, you just got to look at people people like Chester Beddington who was clearly like severely depressed yeah. like, people again we're talking back to the lyrics thing like now that obviously what's happened happened hmm. you you look back at songs like Numb and it it hits home that little bit harder yeah. to just how much he was struggling at the time and yeah. you know people deal with things in different ways I think that's what people forget is that Talking might not be for everyone, yeah. But obviously, like, I'm a big advocate because that that helped me. I, yeah. I spoke to my girlfriend about it, and she pretty much saved my life at my lowest point. Like, I, I didn't, I genuinely didn't want to be here anymore. And yeah. I said, I said that to her, and just, I just had a proper breakdown to her. Um, and yeah, then I went, I went and got help, and it did help at the time. But it, it's not a fix. Yeah. And I think people have got to, if if you are contemplating going to your doctor and, and talking about it go go and do it but don't expect it to cure it yeah. it's, it's not a cure I'm no, I'm no better realistically than I was then yeah. it's just I've learned how to deal with, with you learn to drag yourself yeah. out of it because you're yeah. the only one who can I, I, and learn what works I think you work out what helps you like I have probably two mates that I'll speak to about anything I'm going through and one of them is obviously Ryan he see me in a car at four in the morning on North Road. We'll just talk about life, and he'll just basically listen to me moan or whine for four or five hours. And he might have work the next morning, and he'll still sit and listen. 
basically him and my mate Abby that kind of only really know the extent of whatever it is mm. like I'll go through because I don't really talk to anyone else about it they're the people I trust to have them conversations with the same way that if you get me in a pub or you get me around people I will naturally be the best version of myself like yeah. even being here talking to you about your story or if I'm just at Ryan's making music or we're in Clifton with some of my old schoolmates like you're very social that is me when I'm happy like me locked in my room can still be happy but it, it, that's when I write yeah because I'm probably at my lowest because I come I, I then go into my reflective state and but I analyse what that, I'm doing going back to keeping yourself busy to keep keep your mind mm. at bay songwriting does that for me as well so, yeah. when, so when I have been at my lowest before like before the antidepressants and even now after you, you've just got to try and if talking works for you, talking works. If writing a song to get it all out works for you, yeah. as long as you're not bottling it up and like sort of overwhelming yourself, mm. you've just got to find some sort of release, I yeah. think. And that's why, obviously, everyone's yeah, talk to your mates, check up on people, yeah. and yeah, yeah, do check up on people and do talk to people if that works for you. Yeah. If it doesn't work for you, there's another way to release it, whether it's yeah. going and playing football with, like with your mates and just releasing some anger on a, on a ball or yeah. like whatever like, sort of exercise you're into or whether it is like you say yeah. writing a song and just getting it all out as long as it's out of your head yeah if, if that's still a problem solved talking doesn't necessarily work for everyone I think because I'm I think because my lyrics are quite hot on my sleeve and everything I do is quite emotion based I don't think my mates worry about me because they know that they'll either hear it in a track or I'll message them in the group chat and go, is everyone okay? Like, Because to be fair, my group chat's great for that, so we've got about 11 lads in it. And maybe once every week or two, some, someone will just randomly post going, I ain't heard from you all in a while, lads. Are you all doing okay? If there's anyone that's not, message me. Like, mm. Or someone will message and go, having a bad month, um, can't wait to see you all. And then we'll all probably message them privately and we'll have a conversation. Like, The people I worry about is the ones I know that go quiet in the group chat like if, say if I don't want to name names but if someone, one of my mates will message that they're having a bad time like you know that they've still taken that step to reach out and they yeah. want to kind of connect back with people but you know that that's a positive or that's such a good sign it's the people that are kind of always quiet in the back that are the ones that I feel like you might accidentally lose along the way because you don't think to check up on them like yeah. my mates check up on me quite a lot but like they know that if I was in an issue like they know that I would probably reach out because I've mm. done it before and I trust them with that sort of thing. I think the thing is what you've got with your support group because obviously like you say you speak to me and Abby mm. you've got two very different ways of dealing with it yeah, so yeah. Abby will sit with you and listen and kind of yeah. talk no you're going to be okay blah, blah, blah. you know what I'm like mate like I'll fucking you'll call me out of my shit half the, dra- half the time I'll drag you out of it yeah, because yeah. sometimes that's what works sometimes what Abby does yeah. but if you say if you do that to me and I don't take it well I've never woke up the next morning and held it against you either. Because no. even if I don't take it well at the time of speaking to you, I'll wake up the next morning and go, "Not too fair to tell." Because it's I'm having that trust, though. Like, like you say, it's having that trust with people that you've got to be able to speak to the right people about it. Because mm. there's no there's no right way of dealing with it. No. There there just isn't, and that's why it's such a difficult thing to for doctors to like that's find yeah. find a way to deal with because. It's it's down to the person. Some people like having having the sympathy or yeah. empathy. Yeah. Other people are like being told you you're just being an idiot. Yeah. Like it's all in your head. Just snap out of it. Yeah. And you know this is this is what I find the problem with it is on social media is that everyone's got an a, a, an opinion that will fix it. And mm-hmm. it's you've got to do this if you feel down or you, if you feel depressed or suicidal. You've got to do that. You haven't. Yeah. And it. it it's the same as anything. There's there's no one cure for depression, and no. it it's genuinely a personal thing. Like I said, I tried tablets; they didn't work, and now I, now I found ways to deal with it. I know when to talk to people at the right times when when I can't deal with it anymore, and I know when I can just leave it to fester or create or, or yeah. whatever. Like I know myself now, and I think that's what you've just got. To, you've got to get to a level where you just know yourself. Do you know the comedian Nick Hill? <laughs> yeah. Does, did a show called mm. Uncle and everything. Yeah. We went and saw his stand up in Birmingham, and it's called uh, Rise from the Phoenix, like this show was. And uh, it was very much based around depression. And uh, 
the one kind of like I think it was basically him saying that like antidepressants didn't work because he was like I'm, I'm good at two things he's like one of them's being depressed the other one's coming <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was like and then on, an, antidepressants the only thing I could do was be depressed yeah. like, and uh, to be fair because he's a die-hard Alice Cooper fan he's probably someone I would die to have on this podcast like I genuinely like I think he'd yeah, be a great yeah. episode like, and again I might a really even try, good musician yeah and I might try and message him on Instagram because he, he's just reminded me that I'd really love to get him on this show to talk about it um but yeah, I, th- I think that's the thing, man. Like, I wasn't planning to share any part of me on this mm. podcast because you've just mentioned it. It's made me kind of t- tell a story about the same sort of thing to re- to relate to you. But at the same time, there's probably hopefully there's a musician who say lives in Barnsley at the moment that's just listened to this, and hopefully they hear both of us and go, "Shit, I'm not alone in this." Like, yeah. it's not just me that feels this way. There's there's other people like. Out of three of us at the moment, there's two that have just shared that story. But again, I know that you've had you know your own problems as well and stuff. I just like handle that. things differently, though, don't I? Yeah, I'm exactly. Quite, I'm quite You're more internal. I'm I'm internal, but I'm also quite abrupt. So my struggles usually turn to anger, but not not in a violent way. Like I'm not fucking punching walls, but like. But it was pirate, wasn't it? Pirate. When you stormed out, I had a go oh at yeah, me. yeah, mate, fucking. That again, I'm very abrupt with that. I can't, yeah. I can't necessarily remember what happened. I, I, I remember I fucking, I gave you a fucking mouthful of shit. Basically, <laughs> I, I, I was watching Ryan's rehearsal with his band at the time, and you didn't have money for a battery for a guitar, so the rehearsal kind of went to shit. And the rehearsal had finished, and again, like the atmosphere in the room was quite tense anyway. Like it wasn't a product it wasn't really a successful rehearsal that's like, my issues you when was I'm annoyed down, and you was angry fucking no mm. like, I've, I, I, I think from what I can remember it was like what, probably about a year and a half two years ago I've made a joke you then turned around and basically had a go at me but again because I'd never seen that side of you I thought you was joking so I thought you was like giving me stick back that was the thing is yeah so I've was, kind of gone <laughs> back at you again I was like, screaming and shouting at you mm. And like ready to fucking knock your block off, <laughs> but he thought I was joking. Yeah, because I've never seen that. He like kept it. poking, so I fucking went off, fucking chucked my fucking. And guitar. he disappeared, didn't he? Yeah, mate. I, I fucking bombed it out with my guitar. Fucking launched my guitar across the, across the yeah. car park, and just sat by my car and fucking crawled. It's funny. It co- it comes yeah. back to that yeah. thing though. Like it's just knowing people and knowing knowing. But you now know that. Yeah, exactly. But you didn't yeah, know yeah, what was. buttons to push to get people to. But again, think. once we were outside and we were talking about it, because I then wasn't making the jokes and I was going, why the hell would you give up now? Like, your band's incredible. That was my problem. You've got four people waiting on you at the moment because your, your band's sick, but it's because you're sick. Like, why do you ever give up now? Like, this is brilliant. You're onto something really special. Like, I suppose as soon as, because I then changed, I went, look, you ain't fucking quitting because you're great. Mm. Like, it came from a place of even like impending doom where mm-hmm. I was kind of like, I'm twenty. I was twenty-two at the time. Yeah. I was like, I'm twenty-two. Fuck all's happened. Can't afford a battery. Like literally, mate. I, I I didn't have. I think I needed a nine volt battery to go on my tuner. I didn't have three pounds to go and fetch one. And I didn't have one to get it you either. Yeah, <laughs> mate. And I, I remember I spoke to someone to try and get it off them, and they wouldn't help me. And yeah. they've, they've kind of been an ad, adversary the whole time I've done music. Mm. So that fucking kicked off. Then it was like I'm sat here, twenty-two, no money. And I can't even put a fucking rehearsal together. And like, did he not be a bit of a mate drinking a can of bank to his mall ticket? Yeah, <laughs> like he, he, he sat there pissed out of his tree, <laughs> winding me up. So at the same time, when but I, I genuinely, from that point of view, I was just trying to spread light on what was a very awkward environment. Like mm. it, it never come from like a malicious nature yeah, of me yeah. trying to like dig the knife. And like I was there trying to rally to get you three pounds to get it's you back to get two that hours perspective like, though during the situation. Of course it is. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's the same as when I nearly fucking launched my strap down the stairs, wasn't it? Right. Yeah, I don't think you were here when fucking I fell out with. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. You rang me after it, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd like again people kicking off at me for doing music. Basically judging him for his choices. And then I mm. fucking hit the roof. And my strap was n- nearly halfway down the stairs. Like that's just how I deal with it. But I'll come down very quick. Yeah, yeah. I'll go up two hundred. But then I come down very quick. But because you're very, you're very a lot of the time, like your your emotions never really fluctuate, do they? So I'm pretty bland. Whether whether they're boiling inside, Ryan's always like the most neutral person you'd ever see. So like mm. Ryan on a bad day talks and acts the same way as Ryan on a good day, really. Where he will pick me up from mine, and if I'm on a hung, like hangover or I'm feeling a bit like worse aware, 
you know, fucking, I'll get a beer down and just say, like, you're the Mark, like, I know, because Mark on a good day is yeah, completely you, different to mm-hmm. Mark on, like, a slightly bad day. So where I suppose I fluctuate, but I also know my fluctuations, like, it takes Ryan to get to the other end of the spectrum before it's even shown. Yeah, so when mate, it does show, it's so rare, but, yeah. but again, they're, like, they're both just as valid. Like, I suppose if you used to say, like, you're having a slightly bad day, I might not take it as seriously because you would still act and talk the same. I don't to have me. slightly bad days. Yeah, I have mm. normal Neutral days, or really, or bad or really fucking bad days. Yeah. Like, and again, that's caused fights. Mm. That's caused fucking me to sh- fucking smash it up. Yeah, again, like it's a fucking horrendous way to be. Yeah, like, it's not the way to deal with mm. things. But it's my. But it's your way. But I've got yeah. what yeah. I've got very good at is doing it on my own. Yeah. Where again, I'm, I'm, I don't fucking smash the room up. Like I'm not like I've got. You're not ang- that strong. I've, oh, exactly. <laughs> I'm five foot fucking six. Like, I've got I've got anger issues. I've got I guess I have got anger issues, but it's not like an anger management problem. Yeah, like a yeah. Jack Russell, bro. Yeah, but it's like I've learned to deal with it on my own, and it doesn't affect people now. Mm. Every now and then, it does. Like that night, like when I fucking kicked you out of the band. Yeah. Like, Good times that was. <laughs> <laughs> he's been a kick. Oh, yeah. He's still there. He comes back. <laughs> You don't even know that story. Um, mate, that was a fucking great little sidetrack, that question was. Um, you're on a desert island, what's the one album you're taking me on? Probably. Have to be. Shania Twain live in Vegas. <laughs> That's the, a great The album. best of the kinks. Okay. Just because... It does everything. I, I couldn't live without Waterloo Sunset. Yeah. Could not I, live without it. I'm what's like yours? That. You've t- you've spoke about Ryan and the self titled mate. Want to be Bonnie Vere, Bonnie Vere. Oh, okay. Want to be self titled. There is there is so many that I, I can't well, that's pick, the thing, isn't it? it? Yeah, I think I've, I'm sure I mentioned it. Give earlier. it two months. You'll say the Claws album that's coming out in six months. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's going to be good. Like, like, <laughs> from what I've heard, it's good. I reckon it's going to be sick. Yeah, mate. I've I've heard like half the tracks of it. Should we say top five? Very fucking good. No, because it takes. No, because I'm enjoying this too much. I, I don't think I could pick a top five. Top one, I can nail it. I can nail my colours to the mast and say it'd be the best of the kinks. Okay, so you're taking just, the best of the kinks, but you've got room for one more. Just for Waterloo, so I'd say oh, one more. Um, <laughs> so maybe an album that doesn't have it all, but it has something that you can't live without, or it's more complete than just Waterloo, so say. This is one of the questions you should have asked in the break. Yeah. <laughs> we still got to get his lyric off him? Is that he's given us? Oh, okay, fair enough. It's professional. Yeah, I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> what people will have learned over the four episodes is that Mark is very erratic. <laughs> <laughs> remembers fuck all about anyone. <laughs> I mean, well, but I literally called Alex Jones' guitar player the wrong name and I've known him for fucking years. Yeah, you like, yeah. yeah, I called him Stu. <laughs> Stu, that was it, Stu. What, one small step when it yeah. was one small stone. <laughs> but everything, but basically everything I'll try and do is... Alex Orr. Alex Orr. Alex Orr. Um, no, I, I couldn't pick another one. I'll be here forever if okay. I tried to pick another one. I'm going to nail my colours to the mass just for Waterloo Sunset. Yeah. Best of the King. Okay, and the last uh, question we'll leave you with then is where do you want to see yourself in five years' time or where do you see yourself? I mean, wherever we wherever we may be, I suppose. Um, is the boring Under answer. Scar. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, the, is the boring answer to that wherever wherever we are is is where we deserve to be I think um, yeah. you know if the hard work doesn't pay off then it doesn't pay off but I'd, I'd like to think in five years they should say you tried though more than most in, I'd like mm. to think that in five years maybe we'll, maybe we could get signed maybe I think is that your goal then to get signed or not necessarily it's not the be all and end all mm. for us but, but it, it I feels think, like a pathway to bigger things maybe. yeah I think I think that's sort of the, there's there's levels and I think the bands that we've we've spoke about who who are at the top of the midland yeah, yeah, scene yeah. at the moment I feel like I feel like we're not a million miles away mm. but but we are we are still a way behind mm-hmm. and I'd like to see in the next year or two uh, speaking to the band like that's our aim for the next one or the two next years step, yeah. is to get up to where they are now. obviously they'll Keep they'll up, move yeah, up, they'll yeah, move yeah. up a few levels but we want to be taking their place at that level yeah okay. as as the That's leaders the leaders of this sort of local scene we want to, we want to be at the top of their when life. they're not the local scene yeah. anymore what what we said was that the thing that we like about what the clause and candidate have currently done is that it feels like they work quite closely together 
the best mates. Yeah. They're building something together. So the Claws do well, Candy Claws do well, Candy do well, Claws do well. Like, yeah. It very much seems like a group project to help build what is like. It's not just the Birmingham scene because of Candy. It's the West Midlands scene. At yeah, the it's moment. the Midlands. Yeah. We said the same thing where we was like, ideally, like, we know currently people aren't listening to our music. We're best mates, and if Ryan goes, I go. If mm. I go, Ryan goes. Like, we was like, we could do. Like, we hopefully we could maybe build our own support network that supports both projects, which gets us the opportunities yeah. we need and want to like. So we've we always said we give a, Alex home a support slot if we were playing arenas. Yeah, mate. If I, because, if I looked into Wembley tomorrow, first thing I'd do is like, Ryan's on the bill, yeah. Alex is on the bill. Well, that's kind of where we've gone with it. I mean we're lucky enough that we've done loads of shows with Alex already and, mm-hmm. and vice versa and he, he is brilliant and obviously he's got that know-how as well but again we're, try, we're trying to create a similar sort of thing but I think mm. in the next one or two years we that's where we're going to be pushing for we're going to be pushing for Candid and the Claws and, yeah. and what they've done try and get to that sort of level and then you talk about five years we want to be national level really yeah, yeah. realistically that that's the goal we want to be able to go on tour maybe even just playing 100 cap venues if, if what, that's what it is what blew my mind was when I saw the Amazons play O2 Academy they this obviously after the second album they've turned around to the crowd and went three years ago almost to the day we were playing in the Sunflower Lounge to about 50 people it was like and now we're playing the O2 Academy yeah. and I saw that and went first of all I related to it because it was Sunflower, but I couldn't relate to it because, again, that was their national tour to 50 mm. people. So they're already on a different level than I'm currently at. But I was like, yeah, but if you just get to that point of playing to 50 people in, say, like Manchester, like three years time, you could genuinely be yeah. playing Manchester you're Academy. Playing Rich, and yeah. again, you would break the ice. No, you're not. Like, they played Sunflower Lounge before I even knew who they were. Yeah. Like, I still love both the albums that they've just done. It doesn't make me less of a fan, but I just didn't hear about them until they become your new favourite band don't yeah. they and I've just thought of a question that we never ask what I don't see why we don't ask what are you wearing <laughs> dream venue I was asked this the other day Snake 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 asked me this um, I think my answer then was anywhere and everywhere like with you I'll, 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 I'll play in someone's fucking back garden I don't care but mm. um, I think I've, I've played an acoustic little set at the Royal Albert Hall but I'd love to go back there again That's with a full with a full, yeah. with a full crowd yeah. and not just like a few people you said Wall Civic didn't you? I did say Wall I said it might, might be more addition they went to uh, dream venue or more ramped in Civic the, sound, like, it, the in, sound in the Civic though oh, I know but he's gone, he's gone fucking in he's like can you know, I'm a bit bigger I was like no idea I was like I've done a world tour in arenas I was like and I've uh, come back and I've done like five nights in a row at Wall Civic I was like, like it'd be Red Rocks man <laughs> the Molling yeah. <laughs> the fucking WV Park with, with, with Rob Stewart Jack <laughs> <footsteps, man. laughs> fucking in West Park mate I, I think we wrap up there yeah, that was personally brilliant. like considering we didn't know you to have a like, seen you in person like before and like I genuinely love this conversation I feel like I know you more Hopefully you know, you feel like you know us a bit better, um, mate. I've loved your story and I've, I've loved what you've shared with us as well. Like, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, you can do the YouTube. I've got all the YouTube. Oh my guys, Ryan's Farrow here. Please like and subscribe. Yeah, it's all that bollocks in it. Right, that is the end of the episode. <laughs> thank you very much for watching and thank you very much to you, Jack, for turning up. Uh, and it's been make pleasure. sure that you like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. You two can piss off. Thank you for <laughs> And we'll see you in the next one every Friday, 6 o'clock. See you in a bit.